Welcome to the class, everybody. My name is Ben Gromico. I'm from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspector Home Inspectors. We're the world's largest organization of residential and commercial property inspectors. Uh, we essentially train and certify and provide CE uh, to folks all over the world. So this is a webinar, and uh, we do free live online webinars open to everyone. And this webinar is the home inspection training class number 40. So welcome to class. Um, I got a few links uh, to share and they're at nachi.org slash contact. That's where we all are. There are 28 people that work, wonderful people, good folks, and that work hard to help inspectors be successful. And we're all on the contact page. If you ever need any help for anything, feel free to reach out to us. It's one of the um, greatest resources that InterNACHI members have. You can always contact somebody on the contact page and simply ask, how can you help me? Help me join, help me become a good inspector, help me come, become a better inspector, help me grow my business. So feel free to use that resource. Natchi.org slash webinar, you must have visited that URL, natchi.org slash webinar to register for a free online webinars. We always have at least once a month. And natchi.org slash podcast, that's where you can listen to recorded webinars and other information episodes while driving. Okay, so you should be able to see my screen. Uh, it says, welcome to class. You should be able to see me, I can't see you. You should be able to hear me, hopefully, I can't hear you, but feel free to ask questions. Use the Q&A feature and um, it's on your screen somewhere. Just hit that button and ask a question during this live interactive um, training session about home inspections. And we are going to perform a home inspection on this home, right? But I can't take all 300 of you uh, around a house. So we're gonna do it um, online. And we're gonna talk about a few things. Well, we're gonna perform a home inspection essentially altogether, according to the home inspection standards of practice. We're gonna use the standards as a guide to the inspection process. And we'll, take it, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, we're gonna review nearly 300 inspection images that I took. I inspected the house and I did a few videos of the inspection as well. My clients love the videos. We're gonna read the 54 page home inspection report. And along the way, let's talk about starting a home inspection business, growing your existing business, making more money. That's essentially the goal of being in business, right? Making a good living and marketing strategies. It's really important for folks to know that you're a great inspector and inspection checklists and report writing. That's essential. That's how you communicate your observations with your clients and anything else you'd like. And feel free to ask questions. Um, maybe two hours. It's all up to us, whatever we want to do, go fast, go slow. And um, it's free CE. So if you're an internet member, you just log in to your dashboard, scroll down, click your education records and add two or maybe three um, hours. Uh, if you're attending the live class, uh, you don't get any CE by watching videos. Um, so if you're watching this on YouTube, that's great, but uh, attend the live class or take our free online courses. Um, InterNACHI has over a hundred uh, free online courses and you can take that for CE as well. For non-members, if you're attending the live webinar, uh, feel free to join InterNACHI for free. Um, just go to nachi.org slash free, nachi.org slash free and enter the code webinar month, webinar month, one word, just enter that code. Or uh, if you'd like to join and pay with a 50% discount um, for an entire year of membership, um, you go to that same URL, nachi.org slash free and enter the code webinar. Um, can't use more than one code, so choose wisely. Um, Again, InterNACHI, uh, we're federally tax exempt, 501c6 nonprofit trade organization headquartered in Boulder, Colorado. We have members all over the world and that's at nachi.org. And InterNACHI school um, is inside InterNACHI. So you join the trade organization and you get free access to a, a tuition free college. And we're accredited by the a national accrediting agency of the US Department of Education. And that's at internachi.edu internachi.edu. You can even log in and um, enroll in a course and download your student ID if you wanted to. Um, you get a college card. 
We're doing a webinar here and the URL again is nachi.org slash webinars and they're free online, live, interactive, hopefully valuable and uh, open to everyone. And we also have a podcast, nachi.org slash podcast. And we're gonna talk about websites and marketing and you should get a new website. Make sure it's customized. Make sure it has pictures of you, videos of you and your inspection company um, on the homepage and make sure it converts visitors. Make sure you have access to it, the analytics, make sure you own it. And uh, I like this company, Fast Site for You, serves only InterNACHI members and they're InterNACHI's official vendor for home inspector website designs, Fast Site for You. If you wanted to um, get more details, visit nachi.org, N-A-C-H-I.org slash website. Okay. Let's inspect this house. This is a townhouse and unit. It took me about two and a half hours, I'd say. Again, webinar attendees may upload CE credits to their InterNACHI online account. So when you perform a home inspection, well, you can't waste your client's time. You can't waste your time either. You have to be a time manager. You have to manage your time. And to do that, you have to have an inspection process in place. You can't just go to a home and start uh, following your client's lead. And when they say, oh, what's that? And what's that? And start pointing to things here and there. Um, it'll take you forever to do a home inspection. So what you need is an inspection process. And I do the same thing over and over every time for every inspection. And I, first thing I do is I get there early. And I try to do the roof inspection. So I'll ring the doorbell, I'll, I'll knock on the door. And I'll introduce myself. I'm wearing my ID tag, put my tools on the front step. And then I go and I try to get up on the roof and do the roof inspection. So I show up early. I can't take my client up on the roof inspection anyways, on the roof. It's just too dangerous, right? So if I can get there early and do it before they show up, fantastic. And I do two inspections a day, one at 8 a.m. and one at 12. That's four hours in between takes about an hour to get to the first one. If I can get there early, great. But I'm home before 4.30, 5 o'clock. And I've made about a, a grand because I'll charge about 400 for a home inspection. And then I add ancillary inspections to each home inspection. And an ancillary inspection, like a $120 radon test or a $75 termite inspection, that'll bring me up to five, $600 per inspection. And if I did, can do two a day, and I can because I'm a time manager, I manage my time, I'm bringing a grand home every day, gross to the company. And that was our goal as the owner of a, a company. Our goal was to have every home inspector make a grand. Now, if you're just starting off, you may not be able to do two a day. Fine. Just do one and take your time. Maybe it's four hours long. Maybe you get there a little bit earlier than I do instead of just 15 minutes. Maybe it's a, a half hour earlier. Maybe stay a little bit longer or you go slower. That's fine. You can still compete with someone like me in the marketplace who has to do two inspections because that's where we are in our business model. I've got to keep going. And maybe you can compete with me if you're new by doing Saturday inspections. I hate Saturday and Sunday inspections. I hate Saturday and Sunday inspections, right? In the beginning though, if you're starting off, Maybe you compete with somebody like me in a multi-inspector firm who's doing two inspections a day. Maybe you do Sunday morning inspections and invite the family and you go a little slow, especially for first time home buyers, right? And when I get overflow, if you partner up with me, if we're friendly competitors, we work together. Because when somebody calls me at my office and asks me if I can do a, a Saturday morning inspection and I don't want to, I'll push my overflow to you and we can have an agreement. I never took any kickbacks from my friendly competitors that I pushed over flow work to, because I didn't want to say no. I never said no. I always said yes, and then I figured it out. So I had a network of other inspectors. That's why we at Internet Chi highly recommend you network with your friendly competitors, because you're going to need them. In the beginning, you learn from them, and in the end, you're going to probably partner up with them. So you're both successful. Oh, so here's my inspection time. 
this is my, this is what I did during the day. 745, I show up early and you can compare this schedule with what you do, right? Eight o'clock, my client shows up and I'm doing the exterior and it takes about 15 minutes. 815 to 915, heavy lifting. The next two hours are difficult. First hour is HVAC. That's the most important thing. It's the heart and lungs of the house. And then the plumbing, that's like the veins, the blood, plumbing, drain waste vent, and hot water source. And then the next hour, maybe at most, next half hour, electrical, that's a little difficult. And then foundation, because I'm really looking for moisture intrusion and structural defects, signs of movement and settlement in the foundation. And if I don't have a, a crawl space or basement, I'm pretty giddy because I know I can reduce my time. It's all about time management. I'm not saying fly through the home and skip stuff and go as fast as you can. I'm saying be efficient. So what I did was I got a mobile device, put software on it, uploaded internet checklists on it. So I don't miss a thing, reduces my mistakes. And I'm really good. I look smart. I know everything. I'm following the inspection process. And I do the same thing. When you do the same process, by the way, on every home inspection, a defect is like, it'll trip you. It'll literally, you'll almost fall upon it. It'll smack you in the face because you're doing the same thing for every inspection property. So a defect tends to just pop up. If you don't have a systematic way of moving through the house, then it's, it's hard to find problems, hard to find house problems. So you want to develop a schedule and train all of your inspectors to follow it. You wanna actually, if you're a beginning inspector and you wanna be efficient with your time and make money, because in business you wanna make a lot of money and divide it by your time. So you want a lot of gross revenue divided by a small amount of time. Inspect your home 10, 10 times and see how fast you can do it. See how well you manage your time. See how fast you can inspect an HVAC system Again, you're not blowing through it. You're not skipping anything. You're doing everything that the, your inspection checklist or process requires you, but you're doing it efficiently. You're not wondering what to do next. Kind of like a machine. And everything starts with the standards of practice. And that's at nachi.org slash SOP. Your home inspection process may follow or overlap this. It can be a guide. You start with the standards of practice because that's where the requirements are. What are you required to inspect? and What are you not required to inspect? It's also relief. It's a bit of a burden because it, you're required to inspect a lot of stuff, but it's also relief because you don't have to inspect everything. And that's what the standards of practice is. And you have to communicate that to your clients that you're not required. You shouldn't your clients shouldn't expect you to inspect everything or find every defect in a home. You're only required to inspect what is the minimum standard. And that's the standards of practice. And again, it's the minimum standard. It's the bottom rung. It's the absolute minimum that you are required to do and expected to do during a home inspection. That's a low bar, right? So you are permitted to exceed the standards of practice in order to provide overwhelming value to your clients who expect more. Uh, an example would be like the kitchen isn't specifically listed in the home inspection standards of practice. The parts are, but the kitchen isn't. But your client is going to expect you to inspect the kitchen, right? And so you see the standards of practice. Home inspection standards of practice, another example is home inspection standards of practice doesn't say anything about using a flashlight. The word flashlight doesn't appear in the standards of practice, but everyone expects you to see with a flashlight, right? Because it allows you to see things that you wouldn't be able to see without one. So if you're using a flashlight during a home inspection, you're actually exceeding the standards of practice. It's okay to exceed. So again, I'm going to do the roof. Oh, the, the standards of practice, I can show them to you. Let's go here. Review them, right? Get familiar with them. I got to drag this over here. Here we go. Okay. So here's the standards of practice, actually.org slash SOP. If you scroll down, here's roof. Like what am I required to inspect in a roof? Let's see if I can turn this on. Yeah. 
Well, here it tells you exactly what you're required to inspect, what you're required to describe, and what you shall report as a need of correction in your inspection report. Those three things, inspect, describe in your report, and then is there anything that needs corrected? That's what the standards of practice does for you. And then it lists all the things you're not required to do. And you can add that to your inspection report template and carry it on a mobile device. And that will help you reduce your mistakes because you know what you're required to inspect. And I'm, since the roof section is in the beginning of the standards of practice, and it just makes sense to me to get to the roof first and early, that's what my inspection process is. If we go back here, my inspection process is to show up early and do the roof without my client because I can't take them up on the roof anyways. So I go up on the roof. Okay, I know what you're thinking, right? You're not required to walk upon any roof surface. According to the home inspection standards of practice, the home inspector is not required to walk upon any roof surface, even if that roof surface is flat or relatively flat and only 10 feet off the ground. You're not required to. But my clients in my market expected me to. And before I was a home inspector, I was trained on ladder safety. We actually have a ladder safety course. Internachi has a ladder safety course, a great course on ladder safety. It's fantastic. You should take it if you're going to use a ladder. You're not required to. You're required to inspect the roof. And then if you can't even see it, then you should disclaim it. But you're required to inspect the roof. And there's several ways to do that. From the ground, that's fine. I see a lot of things from the ground. You can use binoculars. You can use a, a non-conductive extendable pole with a wireless camera. You can do that. I've done that. That's fantastic. In certain situations, you got to do that. Uh, to get to a chimney that I don't want to climb, right? Put my ladder up against. You can use a short ladder and get to the, the edge of the roof, maybe the gutter edge, maybe the, the eaves or the gable edge, gable side. You can use other vantage points, maybe from different parts of the other property or maybe a window. I've climbed out many windows. Maybe you can just stick your head out the window, right? If you can get to the porch, maybe you can stand on the porch and look around, right? And then there's the other way. We train inspectors on how to fly drones and become a pilot. You have to pass the FAA in the United States, FAA uh, drone pilot license test. And uh, this, is a, this is a little guy here. This is mine. It's a, it's a mini drone, D. J.I. Um, you can find them on inspectoroutlet.com, inspectoroutlet.com, or inspectorcoach.com, inspectorcoach.com. And it's like 25 grams, very lightweight. Hold, it's in my hand. <clears throat> For those of you listening, I'm holding a drone. It's in my hand, the palm of my hand. And it shoots 4K pictures and 4K video. And it's very easy to use. I mean, extremely easy to use. So you could use this too, but you have in the United States, you have to be... Um, you have to take that test. So there's different ways to inspect the roof. Here's the issue. I'm going to put this in my marketing. I'm going to put this on my website. See my feet. My, this is a picture of my feet, my inspection feet, soft soled shoes, by the way, um, walking on the roof because I want everyone to know that we get up on the roof. So when you visit my website, I'm on a ladder or I'm on the roof. It's dangerous to go up on a roof. It's even dangerous to walk on a ladder, to climb a ladder. You can break, if you fall from the first or second run, you can break your, your ankle, right? If you fall off a ladder, it could be fatal, likely. Fall off a roof, that's fatal, likely. It's very dangerous, don't do it. You don't have to, you're not required to walk upon any roof surface. But this is a, a training experience. So we're learning from each other. And if you're trying to, beat me in the market, which is a lot of fun, then you're going to have to address this issue. I'm trying to find the things that make me different from all the rest. Communicate that message in my marketing. Hopefully it's valuable to my clients. And that answers the question, 
Why should I be hired instead of the next inspector? You have to figure out what those things are. There's a lot of things like USPs and USBs and all that stuff, uh, unique selling points or unique selling or sales pitches or something like that. But something unique and different, you know, differential, something that differentiates you from, differentiates you from all of the rest. And if you have several of those things in your business model, you probably have an advantage over your competition, right? So what makes you unique? Well, me, I get up on every roof that I can and I treat every house, every client with that effort. And I like this picture. It's a picture of my hand touching the shingles. And I can tell everybody, I like to get up close. I want to see things that other inspectors can't. And I'll use a drone or my ladder or something, a flashlight, infrared camera, in order to see things that other inspectors can't. That's why you should hire me. There's another shot there. And remember, I'm going to communicate these unique selling points, let's call them, in my marketing, especially my website. So you have to get a new customizable website where you can customize the headers, the hero images, whenever you want, you need access. And it's got to be a drag and drop. Don't let anybody say, oh, you can't do that. We, we use WordPress. And so you got to learn WordPress. No, you don't have to use, you don't have to learn WordPress anymore. There's no coding anymore. Ask your website designer. I want to add a picture. I want access to my own website. And I want to add a picture today and I want to drag and drop it. Can I do it? And if say, if they say anything other than the three letter word, yes, I think you should consider because this is critical. How are you going to compete with me when I'm doing that to your potential clients? I'm distinguishing myself from all the rest. You have, to, you have to compete with it. Maybe you fly a drone and shoot 4K video. That's pretty good, actually. And that's why I have a drone here in the training class. That's a pretty good way to compete with me. We, we're going to have fun in the market. We're going to look at the chapter meetings and we're going we're gonna to have uh, pie and coffee at the chapter meetings. You're going to be like telling me how, how you flew the drone into a tree. And I'm going to tell you how I almost slid off the roof. And we're going to compete and it's going to be a lot of fun. And we're going to make fun of the other inspectors who are uh, their phones aren't ranking because they're not taking any training classes like this one and trying to figure out what differentiates them from all the rest. We're trying to overwhelm our clients with value. How are you doing it? So if you are the greatest inspector and have overwhelming value for all of your clients and you're not communicating that on your website, you're making a mistake. And if you can't immediately do it, like upload a video, you took this fantastic selfie video of a defect on the roof right? You got up there or you're flying a drone and seeing it or something like that. And you want to update your website because you have to update your website with new stuff. And if you don't have access with an easy drag and drop, you need a new website. I know where to go. Go to natchee.org slash website. Make sure you're able to update your own thing whenever you want. Make sure you own it too. Ask your website designer if they own the domain or you. Yeah, I bet you'll be surprised. Learn how to inspect a roof. We have, I don't know how many roof courses. Some of them are all video-based. If you are that type of learner, um, that's me. I like to see things. I'm that type of learner. You got learning things. So I need to see things, right? Um, and if you like text and reading, we've got that too. Uh, all of our online courses are provided by the college. So go to nachi.org slash education. And in the search field, you can type in anything. Let me just do that real quick, okay? I'm, I'm spending a little bit too much time on, on certain things, so I, I'll speed up through. But if you go to natch.org slash education and use the search field, you can type in roof. Look at what we got. We got a roof, 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 right? Um, I like the 10 steps to inspect a roof. How about, uh, what, somebody said, mold. If I can spell mold, we got mold courses, right? How to perform mold course, healthy homes, uh, indoor air pollutants and toxic mold. You know, if you are weak in certain areas about performing an inspection or how to maintain a home or how to maintain a house roof or something like that, we've got you covered, right? And if you're afraid that every time you step on a ladder, you're afraid, you probably would benefit from some training on safety right? Ladder safety. And we have that. So learn how to use a, a ladder safely 
go to our education page and type in ladder. Okay, this is back to the inspection. This is the chimney. So when I'm on a roof, I can see that I've got a, a chimney. Um, it's a wide berth. It's over 30 inches wide. I need a cricket. It's got it, but it looks brand new. I know this is not a brand new home, but something tells me that this is new. Something's going on. Why would they, this is great. This is the fireplace. No soot, no creosote, the cap, the screen, the collar installed well. I see screws. I see sealant. This is fantastic. A brand new cap on top of the chimney. So this is a wood burning fireplace made out of brick. This is a masonry chimney. This is different from uh, like a, a heating system chimney, like a hot water tank type B vent chimney. If you see a metal coming from your fire, um, from up through the roof, like don't get those two types of chimneys or vents uh, confused. If you see a masonry chimney or fireplace chimney, you have to distinguish the, between the two. I haven't been inside. I really have no idea what's going on. I'm not even sure. This is a row of townhouse. I'm not even sure when the roof ends or where the roof begins, right? So I'm not yelling out a lot of things right now. If I see a problem, I'm going to keep my mouth shut until I figure out what's going on. I'm pretty sure this fireplace goes to this house. So I'm pretty confident. And I'm looking at the flashing. Love the flashing like a brand new, oh, and I have a, a video. Let's see what the video, hopefully you guys can. There's a chimney stack in front of the house with a brand new stainless steel chimney cap, which is very nice. The exterior brick masonry appears to be in good shape. The flashing where the roof meets the chimney stack appears to be in good shape. Hope you heard that. Can you hear that? Hope you heard that. Okay. Uh, I'll attend to some of your questions right after the roof system. And maybe after every system, we'll, we'll hit questions. So I kind of like that video. You know what I do at the end of the inspection? I play videos. I play videos for my clients. They love videos. My inspection report is in the cloud and it can play videos. If you're PDF in your report, if you're faxing your report, <laughs> if you're emailing your report, careful. Um, nowadays, it's, it's, you have to go with the flow. So it's all in the cloud. So you have to have a report writing software that, um, that is modern. And I like Home Gauge, Home Inspector Pro, and Spectora. Those are the three softwares that I actually use. There are many, and I haven't used them all. It's not possible. But those top three are pretty good. But um, check them out. Make sure that you can add video to your inspection report and allow your clients to easily access all the information, all the pictures, all the text, all the illustrations, and the video of the report. Um, this is not a good kick out. So I'm looking at this kick out flashing. I don't know if you can see it, but like, this is not a good kick out flashing. Somebody just got a piece of metal and put two nails in and then put roof sealing on it. And the other side is just as bad, right? I think there's one roofing nail there and then put sealant there. This is not going to work. It's just not going to work. I don't know why they did such a great job on the chimney and the flashing. I see copper flashing installed and step flashing and then the kick out. Uh, maybe they thought, well, it's not needed for masonry could because water isn't going to get behind like it does with stucco, right? It's going to just fall off the roof magically. Well, there's still an opening. Like the gutter end, I don't know if you've installed gutters before. It's impossible to get the gutter end tight up against the siding or the side of the chimney. So there's an opening there and you're supposed to divert that roof runoff into the gutter. And so to explain that difficult concept to a client who has no idea what you're talking about, um, go to our gallery, Inspection Home Inspection Image Gallery, InterNACHI's Home Inspection Image Gallery at nachi.org slash gallery. And there are amazing illustrations that you can download and put in your inspection report. And we've got a lot of stuff about kickoff flashings. So if you're trying to describe what is going on and what it should look like, it should look like a big, dumb looking elephant ear. Those are the best ones. The ugliest kickoff flashings are probably the best ones. Skylights. It's uh, required to inspect skylights, just like chimneys or any roof penetration. Anything that goes through the roof, puts a hole in the roof, like a vent pipe or a skylight. This is essentially a hole in the roof and you want to make it sure it's, it's water proof. Well, water resistant at least. 
that's the minimum standard for a roof covering material. A roof isn't supposed to be, isn't designed to be waterproof. It's designed, designed to be water resistant. So I'm expecting that same standard with this skylight. And basically I have to imagine water. If I poured gallons of water on this skylight, what would happen? Well, it's sloped, so it's going to go down, but I want flashing. I want tight. I want no openings, nothing loose, all sealed, nothing exposed. The step flashing is great. Look at that. That's perfect. Great flashing there. And I'm taking pictures because pictures are free and they're going to put, be put in the report and I'm taking pictures of everything. I went around the skylight. They're great. Here's me touching the ridge vent. Here's me touching the main stack, the vent stack. And there's a type B vent, right? This is, mm, could be the heating system, could be hot water, could be hot, the neighbors, I'm not sure. So I'm just gonna inspect everything and I'll put it in the report later after I figure it all out. There's the collar, there's the flashing. I can imagine water just draining right off of this, just like the roof. I can imagine water just draining right off of this roof penetration. It's got a nice cap, there's a collar, as you can see, I touch everything, right? There's the top, there's just below the top, there's the bottom, and there's the flashing, right? I took four pictures, or five, really, right? One, two, three, four, you know, one, two, three, four, five. And I did a video. On the back side of the house roof, there are a couple metal chimney stacks. The pipes be to be uh, in good shape. The flashing is well sealed. That looks new because the roof has been replaced. There's another chimney stack, no damage or corrosion that I see. The flashing is good. Thanks, Peter, for telling me that uh, everybody that you can hear the video. Awesome. So I take pictures of every plane of the roof, every section of the roof, take pictures, just galore, a lot of pictures, a lot of pictures don't fall off. Just taking pictures, pictures of the gable edge. There's the edge there, the shingle edge, the flashing and another video. Of videos. The asphalt shingle roof is new, high quality shingle. The shingles are lying flat. The granular surface looks good. Plenty of life left on it. I don't see anything cracked, damaged, or missing. Looks like a functional roof. There's a ridge vent on top of the roof providing ventilation. There's a skylight in the front. The exterior looks good. The flashing appears to be properly installed. And there's flashing around the sewer vent pipes, such as this one here. That's good. When I come down off my ladder, my client is pulling up into the driveway. I introduce myself, big smile, first impression, shake hands, haha. -ha. And then, um, I tell them what I'm, what is about to happen. I just did the roof inspection, nothing wrong with the roof. We're going to do the exterior, but if you feel like going inside and taking a look at things and taking a look at measurements and imagining what you're going to do to the kitchen and bathrooms and the paint, feel free. I'm going to keep informing you of where I am and where we are in the inspection process. And if I find anything wrong, or if I need you to see something like, where's the main water shut off valve, I'm going to come and grab you basically it. And then I play the video, play the videos of the roof and they're just, their mouths always drop. And they're like, is, is that my roof? And yep. That's my, that's your roof. I took some videos because you can't get up there with me, right? It's too dangerous. They're like, wow, this is great. And by the time they walk into the front door, they know that they have, we've never met before, but they are fully convinced that they've hired the right inspector. Another flashing issue, great copper flashing, counter flashing, but step flashing, but they just put a little kick flashing in there. It's not going to work, right? And it's up to me to decide whether I'm yelling about this. This is the deal killer, or is this a recommend? Is it just a recommendation, right? Unless I have stucco or something's going on where I can see water penetration. I'm a little concerned about this. I don't know why it's stained in this direction. Maybe there's a good flow of water and it shoots right out because of this diverter. If there's stain marks, below the gutter end, I'm going to, that's great evidence for me. It indicates that there's um, a need to correct this situation. So it's not properly installed. Um, but I'm telling my, telling my clients 
a story of their home, that they're of their dream home, that they're about to move in. I never killed a deal because I'm basically, I'm a storyteller of homes. So you take me through any home and I can tell the story of it. If, if you're, you're, my client is a home buyer and they're buying their dream home. I'm going to tell the story of their dream home. And this is a thing that they have to address and they either do it themselves or they ask the seller to do it, which is a bad idea because sellers are on their way out um, and they're going to do as fast and as cheap as possible. Or you hire a roofer, you hire an inspector to oversee that roofer, make sure it's installed properly. Um, oh, go to overseeit.com, overseeit, one word, dot com, and sign up to be a, uh, one of those inspectors who oversees renovations and, and projects like that. And you can be hired again um, to oversee a project like this, where all the kickouts on the house are installed properly. Okay. So from my video, you can see that the house is older, but the roof has been replaced. And I think they did something with the chimney as well. Everything new with, with the chimney there. I'm impressed by how the copper roof over this little uh, side, maybe the dining room um, roof has been sealed and attached. Looks really good. Just needs to be monitored because sealant isn't permanent. And that's okay. It's part of the home maintenance responsibilities of a homeowner or they can hire their local home inspector to come over every year and take a look around. And there's a skylight, lower skylight. And there's a video about the skylight. The shingle roof in the back with the two skylights is in the same good condition. Um, the skylights appear to have condensation problems. Um, water vapor is condensing in between the two panes of glass called fogged window panes and from this area I can see a few more windows that have that same fogginess a lost seal okay so not a major problem but something that they should know about it'll be on my inspection report the gutters and the downspouts look good I like that the gutter from above is draining directly into the lower gutter instead of splashing onto the the new shingles. See how that was installed. This gutter here, this downspout, sorry, is coming from the upper main large roof, sloped roof, and it's not draining on this lower roof. It's being piped directly into. And there's also uh, some screens on there, so that's nice. It's a nice one. So all of that roof water isn't draining on the lower shingles and eroding that out prematurely. And while I'm there, I'm taking a look at the flashing between the roof, anything that the roof comes in contact with, roof penetrations, chimney, or a wall. So I'm looking at the, the flashing here at the roof to wall intersection. And the windows are wood, original. So I'm going to squeeze there in the corner, bottom corner of the window, maybe at the window seal, maybe the window frame itself, and see if there's anything going on. See if there's any wood rot or soft areas. I might bring out my screwdriver and tap it. Um, so according to the home inspection standards of practice, the inspector shall inspect it from ground level or the eaves, roof covering materials. And we did that. That's in good shape. That's my hand touching the shingles, newer shingles. So they shouldn't have any roof problems, you know, or maybe they did and that's why it was replaced. Whenever I see something like that, it's not original to the house, any system or component that's not original to the house, there was a reason to replace it. And I asked my client, I don't talk directly to the owner or the occupant, I asked my client to get that information. Why was it replaced? Why was the shingle roof replaced here? Why was the chimney cap all replaced and the flashing all redone? There must've been some, something that triggered that, or maybe not, maybe it didn't leak or I don't know. So there's the gutters. I'm required to inspect the gutters and the downspouts. There's the downspout there and the downspout uh, underground drainage pipe. I'm not required to inspect underground drainage systems. And that seems to have been something new because there's dirt there, right? Maybe they cleaned this up or buried it, or it was just discharging on the grass and they went underneath. So maybe I'll find the termination point for it. I'm not going to test it with water or anything. I'm also required to inspect the vents. So I have a ridge vent and I have a soffit vent from underneath. I can see that and flashing like 
roof to wall intersection flashing with the the step flashing and the counter flashing with the siding and the the header here and and the apron flashing and all kinds of flashing around the skylights and where the the copper roof meets the the brick that's all good and skylights i'm required to inspect the skylights I don't like to see silicone I'm not sure what is going on there so i'll take a look on the inside skylights i even say this in my inspection report skylights are just prone to be leaking i mean i don't know i think skylights leak a lot i don't know what your experience is but they they're just not built right they haven't figured it out quite right so skylights leak and that's why you see some white silicone up here someone's trying to stop something from leaking uh chimney required to inspect the chimney so everything looks great except for the kick out flashing and other roof penetrations that's anything that goes through the roof like that bent pipe I inspect those and then the general structure from the roof from readily accessible panels doors or stairs and this is a, an inspection image of the attic space and this happens in about an hour or two from the roof inspection so the inspection of the underside of the roofs and the roof structure like the trusses here actually comes later in the inspection process according to the home inspection standards of practice the inspectors shall describe the type of roof covering materials. That's pretty easy, asphalt shingles. And the inspector shall report as in need of correction any observed indications of active roof leaks. And that's kind of like a tricky issue for some inspectors. What happens if you see a watermark and it's dry? Hmm. I consider it an active roof leak until somebody can say, well, it leaked before and then we fixed that leak. Okay, that's really good information that should have been provided in the seller's disclosure. Um, why wasn't it painted? Why wasn't the drywall painted? Should it easily paint something like that, right? Why leave a bunch of watermarks that indicated a prior roof leak um, before the roof was repaired properly? I don't know. So these questions uh, are really good for your client. And that is the roof system. So I inspected the roof system, it takes about 15 minutes, take a lot of pictures, a lot of video. And then before I get down on the ground, I have inspected the roof. I've taken pictures, taken video. I've written my inspection report because I'm carrying report software on a mobile device on my phone. And before I step down, I'm done, right? I'm done with that section. Now it all depends on how you look at it, but there's like nine or 12 sections, systems um, of an inspection and I'm done with one of them. So I'm feeling really good, right? We found a couple of things like the kickout flashing and the skylight thing, right? Everything else is doing great. So now the exterior is another 15 minutes. It's not, not much more than that, really. It's pretty easy. One time around, maybe two times around, I go counterclockwise all the time. I have an inspection process and I go counterclockwise. For this townhome, I can't go counterclockwise. I, I have, it's a townhome in a row with other townhomes attached to it. So I have to do like a wiggle back and forth, front to back side kind of thing. But I have met my client now and I've scooted them inside. They can follow me around. In fact, I kind of like it when they do. I like to get those questions out, I like to address their concerns, I like to show them things. I don't have to inspect something and, and then come back and inspect it again and essentially you know show them and see it twice or three times, right? I like to have my client with me. Some clients love that. Um, Saturday inspections, Sunday inspections, you know, Uncle Bob comes and wants to ask questions about the electrical. That's fine. I love family members, kids are running around. That's great. Um, it's a big family event, should be. Um, and the purpose is, again, time management. <laughs> you know, as a business owner, you have to think about that. It's not just doing a great inspection, it's managing your time and business operations. And I don't want to answer questions at night. My, my competitors are, hopefully my competitors are wearing themselves out, writing inspection reports at night and answering questions by email and phone at night. And they're all tired and are doing terrible inspections and they're gonna wear out and they won't be there in a couple of years. But if you're, if you're efficient with your time and in your, in your managing your inspection process, and you have procedures down and you're thinking like, hmm, I don't wanna 
answer questions at night. I don't want to write the inspection report for two hours at night. I want to write as I inspect. Then that is a really good competitive advantage that you have over your competitors. Question, what study materials do you recommend to pass the exam on the first try? Mm, don't worry about that. Andres, uh, I would just take the exam. Internet, uh, I'm assuming you're referring to InterNACHI's home inspector exam, a valid exam for home inspectors. Um, take it, it's free. You can take it as many times as you want. And at the end of the inspection, uh, at the end of the exam, it tells you where you're strong and where you're weak. And where you're weak, it'll give you a recommendation to strengthen that weakness and knowledge by taking a free online course. Everything's free. So I would take it with InterNACHI. Everything is free. So I would take the online exam. You can take it as a non-member too. You can be a, um, a free guest to take the exam. So I would take the exam. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about trying to pass it on the first try. Does the government jobs or opportunity recognize the internet? Yes. So you can just go to um, our credentials and we have a long list of approvals. It's, I think it's natchiorg slash approved. I haven't been there for a little bit. natchiorg slash approved. Yep. natchiorg slash approved. natchiorg slash approved. Um, John asks, uh, what inspection software do you use personally? I like those three, uh, Home Gauge, Home Inspector Pro, and um, Spectora. Um, I'm planning on using, but there are other probably very good inspection software out there. I just don't know them. I can't use them all. Um, I'm planning on using drone inspection. Is it a good, it's a fantastic idea. Get the, we already did this. Um, I already just the, this is my drone. You can get it from Inspector Outlet or Inspector Coach. Um, it's 25 grams, um, but you have to, if for commercial purposes, you have to, um, to pass a, a government exam, it's essentially to be a pilot for an unmanned uh, aircraft. Um, the exam is difficult if you don't take any training. So we have a training course. You go to natchiorg slash education and type in drone, and we can help you with that. Uh, the training comes from the government. So it's a government uh, content to help pass that exam. Um, and it's good for CE as well. You have to take CE always. Um, will the slides be available? Sure. You can email me or I'm on the contact page and I'll also put it on the webinar page, natural.org slash webinar. What type of device, safety devices do you use? Remember the safety ropes, what type do you use? Yeah. If I can tie off, I will. Um, there, you can go crazy. Um, I often don't. And that's the danger, right? If you, um, are not comfortable with, um, getting up on the ladder, I am. Uh, built houses before I was a home inspector, um, installed a lot of roofs, uh, and then did home inspections and did crazy slopes. Um, but I highly recommend getting trained and certified. Um, you can get trained and certified using ladders through internet if you wanted to. What type, oh, here, let me just bring this over so you can all see. Uh, Joseph asked, during the inspection, second exhaust vent didn't seem to have the 10 inch from surface. Um, I think they all did. Yeah. The second exhaust vent, the, the, the drain waste vent, the stack. So, or the, the type B, I think they were all good with clearances from the roof surface. Um, I can go back, but sometimes you miss things. How, how do you carry all of your tools safely? Uh, it's a tool bag. So I got those elongated. I got that. That's not with me. It's an elongated tool bag, right? Uh, it's like 28 inches, something like 24. I like the big one with the big handle and the shoulder strap. And um, you can put in just about everything um, in that bag. And I do that immediately. I get out of my van, go around the back, put a cone in the back of my van, open up the doors, grab my bag, and then grab my stepladder because it's usually in this type of house is going to be a stepladder to get to the attic space that's in a closet of a bedroom or something like that. So I'm bringing my ladder and my tool bag and I put it all next to the front door and I'll get to that later. I got to do the roof and the exterior inspection and I um, carry all my tools safely. Oh, and a tool belt. So I like the, um, the framers belt. So uh, with like two pouches and a couple of slots. So it's a um, contractor's belt or a roof framers belt, two pouches, two 
different kinds of nails if you wanted to, and a hammer holder, which is um, could be for your flashlight. Uh, I like the police um, holder. You just Google police uh, flashlight holder, um, stick it in there. And you got to get a lumens flashlight, a really high end uh, lumens flashlight. That could be a couple hundred bucks for a really good flashlight. Um, and uh, that's how I carry everything. Tool belt, tool bag, and my hands. How do you carry tools safely? Uh, and then if you're doing a ladder, you got to hop that ladder around. And that, you got to watch your shoulders. So you got to work out. Do you review the seller's disclosure before the inspection? No, not before the inspection. Sometimes if I see it on the kitchen counter, I'll take uh, digital snaps of it. Um, if you take the online exam and pass a low score, then you take it again and get a lower score and not passing will it go to the most recent score. Um, it, uh, anonymous attendee. Talking about the internet exam, you can take it as many times as you want. It's all confidential, so you can fail it. And then there isn't a most recent anything with exams. Um, if you pass it with a 85 and you want to get a 90 and you pass it with a 90, you have those two scores and you actually have that evidence that you passed the exam with those two scores on those two dates. So it's up to you to share whatever you want or pat yourself on the back for doing the better the second time. Nobody knows. Nobody has access to that. You only share what you want to share, right? You could fail it 50 times and pass it 50 times with 50 different scores. And it's up to you to share it. No one has access to that. It's all confidential. Hope that uh, helps. Uh, how do you manage to do an exterior? Oh, and it's free and online. You don't have to wait to take it again. How do you manage to do an exterior inspection, take photos and write a report in 15 minutes? Practice. Practice. After, after you know, 5,000 inspections, you get really good. So um, you have to practice. You have to put in your hours. If you haven't inspected your home 10 times, and that's a mistake. People are going to see that you're just fumbling around and taking too long to do it. So you have to inspect everything. Like inspect your friend's house. You going over your friends this weekend, inspect the deck. See if you can inspect the deck in 10 minutes, five minutes. See how fast you can do it and find everything, right? Um, if you're doing pool inspections, try that. Do it. I would just inspect your bathroom 10 times. Inspect the bath. See how fast you can do a kitchen inspection. See how fast you can do it and efficient and not miss a thing. Okay. That's what I would do. And then you're totally, and then, you know, you should be inspecting your neighbor's homes. I mean, why aren't you inspecting your neighbor's homes? Right. How do you manage to do an exterior inspection? Take photos and write. I, I inspected everyone's home. I inspected my home a hundred times. Inspected my neighbor's homes, my family's homes, my friends' homes, everywhere I go, I inspect. Can't stop looking up and looking around and inspect. I walk around with my wife every morning and get coffee and I'm inspecting everyone's exterior homes from the sidewalk in the street. Inspect, 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 inspect. Taking pictures like crazy. And if you're using your software, that, I mean, this is what you do. You have to, how do you manage to do an inspect really fast? Practice, you have to inspect. How do you handle big dogs in backward? Sometimes I don't. If it's a pit bull, I just leave. I take a picture or a video of the pit bull um, wanting to eat me. And then I just go and we schedule it later. Um, if it's a big dog in the backyard fence, I won't go in the back and I'll disclaim it. I'll tell my client, we can't go back there. And if the cl client wants to go or an agent wants to go and they don't get eaten, I'll follow them. Um, what if, you're, if you walk on the roof and damage it? Never did, but if I did, I would take a picture of it and I'd own up to it and I'd pay for the repair. This has happened many times, but never on a roof for some reason. I've never damaged a roof. Um, I've done mistakes though. Like, oh, I don't know. Like, uh, how about the GFCI in the garage, right? You're supposed to test the GFCI, all the receptacles, all of them in the garage have to be GFCI protected unless it's like a dedicated refrigerator thing. And then I test it. And then, uh, oh, I forgot to reset it or something, right? Because I'm off my inspection process for some reason. I got to reset that GFCI. Or maybe I told myself, it's at the electrical panel downstairs. I got to remember to reset that G electrical GFCI. And I forget. Turns out, this is a real true story. Uh, refrigerator filled with cold wine uh, went warm. So we went back, um, paid for all the wine and brought flowers. And everyone was okay. So I, I paid for it. I owned up to it. 
But guess what? Because you're a owner of a home inspection business, you got to think creatively. So when you make a mistake and you make everybody whole, you then communicate that to all parties, right? And when I told the listing agent what had happened, that listing agent spread that story all over the place. That Peach Inspections, that was our company now, Peach Inspections, Chilled Wine, GFCI, Warm, paid for everything and a, uh, a dozen flowers, right? Made everybody whole and more. And that story went around because a lot of inspectors in my area were trying to like hide from responsibility and they didn't understand that that act of making a mistake, fixing it and making everybody whole and going above and beyond is like marketing. You almost want to make a mistake. It's one of the best things that ever happened. Oh, another thing is I, I went in the wrong direction, wrong address, took an hour to get to the, so instead of showing up at 12, I just showed up at one, did the entire inspection, showed up late, we're never late, showed up late from the inspection. Everyone's like tense. I did the inspection, did a great inspection, super inspection. And then at, at the end of the inspection, we said, it's free. That story, because I was late for an hour, that story went around all over the place. It was worth the 500 bucks. I couldn't have spent that type of marketing, word of mouth marketing, to tell a story about how they showed up late. And then after the inspection, they said, because we were late, the inspection's on us. Yeah. So um, while you're inspect, oh, I love sticking my screwdriver into rotten wood too. And then taking a picture of the screwdriver stuck in wood. So it's damaged, it's damaged wood. I just found it and I stuck my screwdriver in it to show that it's completely structurally defective. I don't actually damage wood. You don't damage rotten wood. It, the, the wood is already rotten, right? Um, while you're inspecting, um, while you're inspecting, well, there's another one, like the dishwasher leaked on the floor. There's a lot of things happen. So you turn on the dishwasher, turn your head, go in the living room, come back and there's water all over the floor, right? Seller knew, right? Seller knew. So uh, I don't, I get immediately get up, get towels, paper towels, dishcloths, you know, I'm wiping up the water and it's filled with water. So it's got to be drained somehow, but I'm not going to do it. And I take a picture of it and I put it in a report as a defect. I don't buy a dishwasher. I don't pay for the gasket or anything like that, right? Your job is to find problems. And if you do damage during an inspection, like another one, like, you know, you reach underneath the old bathroom sink and it's a soft brass chrome plated soft brass and it crushes in your hand. That's fantastic. You take a picture of it. If you do damage during an inspection, if you trip a GFCI and it won't reset, that's fantastic. Put, and you're not taking responsibility for it, right? But if you do something like my dumb thing where I didn't reset a GFCI and the chilled wine went warm, yeah, then take take responsibility for that and then turn it into a great marketing opportunity. Uh, while you're inspecting using whatever software pictures go annotating software notes on the pad, running into the software. Um, hi, Edward. it seems like, how do you use software? I would just buy the software and start using it and you'll figure it out. Do you take a picture first? Do you click the sentence or you do take the picture first and then click the sentence, something like that. Would, what would you charge for water quality test annual home inspection? Um, Lane, it really doesn't matter. What I, what I think, what you should charge for an inspection service is based upon math. And so you go to our home inspection business course and jump to chapter 11. You don't have to take the whole course, just jump to chapter 11 and go through the exercise of inspector John trying to figure out what he should charge for his inspection fee, making it profitable, right? And I think that would be helpful. So go to our education page, natural such education, and uh, search for business and take the home inspection business course. Okay, those are good questions. Exterior. Well, let's move through this exterior a little bit faster maybe because it's already an hour. You go to the home inspection standards of practice, figure out what you're required to inspect and not required to inspect. If you don't know how to inspect the exterior, you search for exterior in the search field of our education page. And we've got a couple in there. They're really good. 
You have to inspect the exterior wall covering materials. That's what it's called in the code. So we do that in InterNACHI, right? All of our courses, our entire curriculum is based upon standards like the International Residential Code. And the International Residential Code calls it exterior wall covering materials. So we call it that as well. And you should call it that as well in your inspection report, right? You can say siding if you wanted to. So I'm checking that out. There's the exterior wall. It's brick, right? Brick, 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 brick. Some wood, wood trim, wood around the windows. Okay, but it's really brick and aluminum. Got a piece of rotten wood. It's a trim board on a party wall, you know, um, so that nobody can see inside the bedroom or whatever. So then no big deal. And as you can tell in this inspection picture, it's raining. That's a perfect time to do a home inspection. No lightning, a little bit of rain. So you can see where the water goes. I love following water. Where does water go? Um, and if you wanted to see what the standards are for siding, exterior wall covering materials, it's in the codes. And the, the International Residential Code, the International Code Council has done something fantastic. They put their code publicly online. So you can click this button here and you can see, and Internet uses the code uh, as the foundation for, our, um, as a reference, I would say, as a reference, the main reference to all of our curriculum. And uh, chapter seven of the code uh, talks about wall covering. And then they reference exterior wall covering and all the materials there. It also includes vapor retarders and wind resistance and other retards and exterior wall covering and water resistant barrier. So it's really, it's, that's the terminology. And there's a standard too about how um, exterior wall covering materials should be installed, right? And if we, understand this, the standard, then we can apply that to our inspection process and our observations. And we, when we talk about siding or eaves, soffit and fascia, that's in the code as well. And we're all on the same page with our terminology as well. Terminology is important. A representative number of windows, you're not required to inspect all of the windows from the exterior. Um, it's impossible, right? You'd be uh, carrying your ladder all around. There's me pushing my thumb into rotten wood in the window frame itself, not the trim. So that's a defect that needs to be repaired, right? It could be, it's a repair. You probably need a contractor. Maybe the home owner can do it yourself. So it's between a minor and major repair. And that's me with the, the skylights, right? And you have to inspect all this exterior doors. So all the exterior, like the garage door. And when I inspect a door, I, it's like a window. I go top right, oh, sorry, top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. Right, and I do those corners, the heading, the bottom, and then at the bottom, like this garage door, I'm looking at the bottom left, the center and the bottom right, looking for wood rot. But there's the front door, I'm looking at the treads, the risers, the treads, the landing, the width, any defects in the settlement, the slope, right? And I see a little settlement crack, that's no big deal. It doesn't go any higher than that. Um, some mortar joints in a crack right through. I think it's a settlement of something going on with the the the, uh, the metal that holds the iron that holds up the brick veneer above it. There's some weight on it. Um, I put my eye on the edge of things in order to see if it's deflecting, sagging down. If it isn't, then I'm gonna let it go. It's a call really. And then there's the door on the outside going to the exterior door, um, outside patio in the rear, top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right, and I find wood rot. So there's a good shot of wood rot right there. So that needs to be repaired. It's a trim board. I'm not jumping up and down. It's a minor thing. The story of the house is great so far. Roof is great, exterior brick. I love exterior brick. It lasts forever, right? And there's some code that comes with like this, this picture right here is of the tread of the rear door that has wood rot on the left, bottom left, to the patio. And there's like some code that you can think, like, cause I'm a little concerned that how low this step is. It's really nice, but what happens when like water lands here and splashes, right? This is like a two inch riser, which is fine, right? It's fine. You can't have like really tall risers, right? Like there's like a minimum here of like two inches. Like it's okay. You know, maybe it's, 
it's a trip hazard. Maybe it's not. It all depends. There's actually code about these things, right? The exterior landing at an egress door, that's what we're talking about, can be at most seven and three quarter inches. So there's a limit to the height, not to the, there's not a minimum, right? Below the top of the threshold. And that's from the top of the threshold. So there's the, what's the threshold? It, the threshold's that middle part. It's not actually this part. It's not the concrete part. It's not the floor part. It's the, this is the threshold, right? And this, this uh, weather stripping, this rubber thing could be at the bottom of the door or at the top of the door. And I drew it with the bottom because it's not, that's not the top of the threshold actually. So it's this, and it's the maximum of seven and three quarter inches. So we're okay here, right? There's the threshold maximum seven and three quarter inches, but it could be whatever minimum, right? And this really should have been pulled out. I think I don't like wood up against the masonry where I don't know if this is draining, but I'm not, that's just an observation as a home inspector trying to figure things out where water is because home inspectors are not code inspectors. Home inspections are not code inspections, but everything home inspectors look at are related to code, building standards, best practices, building science, safety features. So knowing a little bit about those topics, I think helped me be a home a better home inspector. So if you want to learn some code in order to be better at your job, we have a free online property maintenance and housing code inspector course. You can become ICC code certified. You can be, I'm a code certified inspector in this, uh, by taking this course that helped me prepare to take the ICC exam. So ICC certifies them, will certify the code inspector. I think it's a great course. Go to nachi.org education page, search for code, take the course. It's a really good course. I like it. According to home inspection standards of practice, I need to inspect the flashing and trim. I did that. Adjacent walkways and driveways. Yep, I did that. There's the walkways, there's the driveways. Driveway looks great, asphalt. Stairs, steps, stoops, stairways and ramps. Yep. Porches, patios, decks and balconies and carports. Mm-hmm. Railings, guardrails and handrails. We don't have any. Vegetation, surface drainage, retaining walls and grading of the property where it may adversely affect the, the structure. And I did that. Took a look around, remember that underground drainage pipe and everything sloped away. There's a swale on the side of the house. This is great, great. I don't expect to see any problems in the basement, but it turns out I don't have a basement. It's a slab on grade house, which is cool. According to home inspection standards of practice, the inspector shall describe the type of the exterior wall covering materials, done it. Remember, we were required to inspect it and then we have to describe it and then report upon any problems, right? But you can inspect other systems and components too while you're out there, of course, like the electrical could be outside. That's a system that really appears later in my inspection process or inspection report, um, but I'll inspect them all. I'll, I'll juggle the air conditioning unit on the outside and I'll wait um, to comment upon it or put it in the, um, uh, oh, let's see, when I, I wanna, I'm required to inspect a bunch of systems and some of those systems overlap, right? But my inspection process has to be smooth. So I'm not going in and out of the house because, oh, I have to do the air conditioning. And so I go from the attic to the air conditioning. I'm just inspecting everything on the exterior and then I'm able to easily enter things like the electrical meter in the electrical section of my report because I'm using a mobile device to write my report as I inspect. So it's easy. I just go from exterior to, for example, electrical, and I type in my comments, take pictures in the electrical, and I pop back out and I'm back into the exterior. That's the beauty of unit using um, mobile software. GFCIs, part of the electrical system, could be part of the electrical part of your inspection report, or it could be a part of the exterior report. Outside hose bibs. Hose, hose bibs are kind of, I don't know why they call them bibs, B-I-B-B, -B, but this is a hose bib and bibs that are subject to freezing temperatures. So this is a, in a cold climate. So it's subject to freezing, um, including frost proof hose bibs. They should have their stem extended through the building insulation into an open heated or semi-conditioned space. There should also be an accessible shutoff valve installed on the water supply pipe that leads to the hose bib. 
And this one is not a frost-free hose bib and it really should be. No big deal. There's an illustration. You can find this illustration in the gallery. I already showed you where you can find the kick out flashing, same gallery. And there's an illustration to describe to your client what it should kind of look like. If you're doing other inspections, like you run into a pool or maybe the exterior wall covering materials is stucco, and you wanna be trained and in, in certified in inspecting stucco, we have over 60 additional types of inspection certifications. You get the home inspection certification from InterNACHI, but we have over 60 other types of inspector certifications. Why? Well, remember in the beginning of the class where I talked about making money, $1,000 a day? You do that by adding one of the best ways that increase gross revenue is to add ancillary inspections to your inspection service and bundle them. So when I do a home inspection, my office manager is trying to bundle other inspection services. And sometimes my clients don't even realize, they're not even aware that they can do that, that we can do other things like we can do a home inspection and a radon test and a pool inspection and put them all together, right? People love bundling things, product services, like a big happy meal of inspection services, right? And you discount the total price. So you can go to natchi.org slash certification and get trained and certified in additional inspection services. And that's a great way to make more money. Heating system is next. Questions? We do. Do you measure the lintel sagging over the garage door and center? No. To be clear, when you say, I, I don't even measure, I don't measure anything. If it's sagging and I see it, I'll put it in the report. If it's like a major defect, for sure. Like if there's a major structural movement, signs of settlement and movement, I'll put it in my inspection report as a major defect that needs a structural engineer, for sure. But let's say I don't see it. It's above my head and I don't observe it during the inspection. It won't be in the inspection report because I didn't even see it. I did not observe indications of this defect during my inspection report, during my inspection, sorry. At the time of the inspection, I didn't, I didn't observe it. So it won't be in the report. Why isn't it in the report? Because I didn't observe it. Or I, and so therefore I'm not responsible for it. Let's say I did observe it. And I think it's a material defect. That's the, that's the big one. I both observe and deem it, consider it to be a material defect. It better be in the report. Otherwise that's a mistake. And I'm responsible for that. I'm not responsible for like things I don't see. And I'm not responsible for defects that I don't think are material either. If I look at something, mm -hmm, I see that thing. Mm -hmm, and I don't think it's a material defect. It's not going to be in a report either. It has to be both. Both of those things have to happen. I have to see it during the inspection, obviously, right, Judge? I have to see it during the inspection. And after I see it, I have to consider it to be a material defect in order for that to be in the inspection report. Otherwise, it's not in the report, and I'm not responsible for it. So good, good question, John. To be clear, when you say you don't, when you say let it go, do you may... Do you man you report, but it doesn't show it as a defect report at all? I'm sorry, LaVonda, I don't understand what you're saying. So ICC still has to certify, correct? ICC's, ICC course is only for prep, right? The ICC um, examinations, if you pass them, if you pass the code inspector examination provided by ICC, you're certified. You're a code, you're ICC certified as a code inspector. To pass that exam, they tell you what you need to read <laughs> and prep on. And um, they recognize international courses because we're an ICC preferred education provider and they have approved, oh, I don't know, over a hundred of our online courses. So if you wanna take the code, cor code exam that I just referred to, I would take the course that international provides to help you with that, that topic. What, was that a tree next to the foundation? Oh, I don't know. Root damage from the tree. Oh, I don't know, Joseph. Maybe there was. 
That's a good one. You're not required to inspect trees, but if you do, and you think it's you know, too close, you can add that to the report. Because we have illustrations that show how roots push up against foundations. Um, if you see an indication that's possibly related to that tree growth, that's really good, putting those two together. If you see a tree and it's not causing any observable indications of uh, structural problems, there's a bit of a story there that you have to tell that, mm, you know, not sure if it's causing problems, but if it was actually causing problems that, and you saw the indications of those structural problems that could be related to that tree that's too close to the foundation, now you've got a good story to tell. And it should be in the report. I would put it in a report if I saw that. Um, Let's see. So we're going to heating. According to the home inspection standards practice, we are uh, required to inspect the heating system using normal operating controls. And that means thermostat. There's the heating system there. I see the vent pipe coming up, mid efficiency. There's the gas supply line, shut off valve, drip, air conditioner unit. It's on the bottom. Heating systems on top. Air conditioning is on bottom. Oh, it's a downflow. So this is going downwards. For me, I like it's like flipped upside down. Because usually for me, things are going up. This is a downflow. So it's pushing air down. It comes up from here. Must be like underground ductwork or something. Because I'm, I'm, there's no cross space. And then it goes down. It gets, gets heated, air conditioned, get conditioned, and then goes down. So if I can see some floor registers, open them up, see what's in there. Maybe stick my camera down there, take a picture with a flash on. Maybe there's uh, problems, maybe there's not, I don't know. I can't, I can't observe it, right? If I can't observe it, I'm not responsible for it. I can't see it, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, but here's a normal operating control. I like to turn that off. I don't touch those, I don't, I like to turn off the service switch on and off. When I'm inspecting the heating system and the air conditioning system, I don't turn gas valves, right? You really shouldn't, because if you cause a leak, then that's a major problem. And there's the flue pipe going up. I'm okay with the clearance. It's duct work. There's the, uh, there's the air filter. There's the air filter there on the return side, right direction, clean. They knew we were coming. There's the air conditioning. That's the refrigerant line. I don't know where it goes. Going in the floor, it's kind of odd. There's the other refrigerant line. Wish I could see those going in conduit. I really can't. You can see, I don't know what is going on there, but I would love to just see, you know, PVC four inch pipe or three inch pipe. Everything's going through there or something like that, to, just for protection. Um, but I'm not responsible for anything. I like to take a look at the service uh, sticker. If it hasn't been serviced and cleaned in the year, I put that in the report as a recommendation. I always do that. If it was serviced and cleaned recently, I'm good. If it was serviced and cleaned three years ago, two years ago, I put that in an inspection report. Now the HVAC recommendation is in my inspection report. If there's ever a problem with the furnace, like, hey, I recommended it to be serviced and cleaned before you move in. Did you do that? No. Uh, did you do that? Yeah. And he found problems. That's great. He said, you were supposed to see them. I said, nope. I'm not an HVAC technician. I'm a home inspector. Right? I'm only required to see things that uh, I don't use my hands, right? It's like a home inspection is like having both hands tied behind your back and looking around. HVAC technician, it's got all this equipment and measuring devices and voltage, and it's going to tear things apart. And she's going to take the jacket off and take a look, at the, maybe probe something in a heat exchanger and take a Delta T measurement, all this stuff. It's a, uh, HVAC technicians, she's going to do something much more extensive than I can. I'm just a home inspector. Of course, they're going to find something wrong, right? <laughs> so always recommend an HVAC technician, a service and cleaning of the heating and or cooling system if it hasn't been serviced and cleaned within the past year. That's a great tip. If you don't know how to inspect a gas furnace, we have a checklist. And then you take that checklist and you customize it to how you perform an inspection of a gas furnace. Maybe dumb it down because you know our our checklist is like i don't know it's like 20 pages long you don't have to do that so simplify it a little bit right and then put in your software 
so that while you're standing in front of the HVAC system, you know what to inspect according to your inspection process and it's customized to fit you, what you do and how you do it. You write little notes, see what's first, second, third, have little sentences of good things. Oh, that turned on, that's great. Or sentences of defects. If you see a defect, you just click that sentence, take a picture, boom. And practice on your own heating system. You should get that down to about 15 minutes. According to home inspection standards practice, you're required to describe the location. You're, you have to inspect it, but you also have to describe the location of the thermostat, energy source, and heating method. So there's the thermostat there, energy source. There's a the natural gas on the outside. This now appears in my inspection report in the heating section, even though I already inspected it with the second system. The second, first system was roof, second system is exterior. And now it appears in my report now under heating. It's natural gas. There's the gas meter. That's the gas shutoff valve. I'm not worried about the surface rust. And there's the gas shutoff valve next to the appliance. Every appliance should have a shutoff valve. And the heating method is ductwork, right? So I got ductwork. And when you see an air filter, um, that's forced air. You have to report anything that didn't work or deemed inaccessible. Um, no problems there. Cooling, according to the home inspection standards practice, I have to inspect the cooling system according to normal operating controls. There's a thermostat. Describe the location of the thermostat and the cooling method. Well, there it is there. It's a split system. I'd like to take a picture of the manufacturing label. There's an electrical disconnect. Condensate is dripping out. Um, refrigerant lines look good. It's on a base. It's stable. There's refrigerant lines there. Any cooling system that didn't operate, I got to put it in the report as a need of correction or if it was inaccessible. Plumbing. Uh, any questions on that? Yeah, maybe. Uh, please forgive me. I was talking about the crack in the wall above the angle iron, right? Um, above the front door. You only add it to a report if you both see it and uh, it's a material defect, right? So um, I'll put like cosmetic defects in my re report that I observe if I wanted to, if my client expects it, that's fine. Like a, like a, a burn mark in the carpet, cosmetic, no big deal. I'll put in a report if my client wants me to. It, it only takes me a couple more seconds. Minor defects are like a dirty air filter. A minor defect is for me is, um, these are defined in the glossary. You can use these terms, terms or, or not. But a minor defect is something like a uh, dirty air filter that can be um, attended to by the homeowner without knowledge or skills. Um, and then a major defect is like a hole in the roof. We need a, a or a improper kickout flashing around the chimney. We need a, a contractor. And a material defect is it's so bad it's going to hurt somebody. And we haven't come across that in this inspection yet. So the settlement crack above the front door in the brick veneer that's being held, hopefully, by the angle iron is not a major defect in my opinion. It is not causing major structural movement. It is a hairline crack through the mortar joint and the brick itself. It may have settled almost immediately when the house was built. It's not causing other problems. There isn't water coming through. It's not separated much. It's not displaced. It's not open in one end and closed in the other. There isn't movement in and out. Um, nothing loose. I'll put it in a report. If my client is with me, I'll tell them about it because they'll probably ask me, did you see the crack above the... So I'll, I'll tell them, I'll put it in a report. It's something to monitor, right? Good question, Lavonda. I'm glad we uh, got that all cleared up. Sorry, I didn't understand the first question. Jason. Why can't I see those chats? I'm not sure. Um, can you see my screen? You should be able to see screens of, if you can see pictures or something. Oh, maybe the Q and A chat isn't showing up in the webinar thing. Well, I, I'm looking at everyone's questions um, and I'm going through the list. Let's see. So if you can't see them, that's okay. Uh, do you ever, you can go to, on your side though. Maybe it's not in the shared video screen of the webinar, um, but it, on, it should be on your side. You should be able to see everyone's questions. It's the Q&A feature, not the chat. Do you ever use an inspection scope to see around or behind object? Yeah, I don't have it with me. Um, I've got some tools behind me. Um, uh, only if I needed to. 
man, I pull out the scope. I got a, a 18 inch scope, you know, with a little screen and you can stick it in a hole, you know, looking around. I think I did that once or twice in 10 years. You can, I mean, it's just, I really need to, like, I really need to do this. I don't have to, but if my client says you really need to, we then I'll pull it out. Right. Trying to be, trying to manage my time and I don't have to, you know, see behind objects or get, you know, I have to put a scope in the heat exchanger. I don't have to. Um, so I'm not going to, what is the lowest outside? You have to manage your time. I mean, I could spend, I love inspecting homes. I could spend an entire week inspecting one home, but that's not what a home inspection service is. It's tough to say no, like it's tough to limit yourself. It's so much fun inspecting your house. I can go on forever. Right. But uh, what is the lowest outside temperature you would test? You don't have to worry about that anymore. Uh, master HVAC technicians and manufacturers have all said like, you know, uh, don't have to worry about that, but I'm old school. If it's cold outside, I ain't turning the air conditioner on. <laughs> um, you don't have to worry about that nowadays. So it's okay, but I, I just don't in, in cold climates, I just don't turn on the air conditioner. They say it's okay. Uh, I'll see you in another 10 years. Do you operate AC? Oh, same thing. Charles and Lane, uh, say it again. Um, Jason. Yes. That's what I couldn't see. Okay. Uh, it's because you only present during, you know, Oh, uh, I can only see the questions. Okay. Uh, when recommending further evaluations by a licensed specialist, instead of recommending the wrong type of contract, when recommending further evaluation by a licensed specialist, instead of recommending the wrong type of contractor, example, garbage disposal are not working and recommend a plumber be nearly electrician. Well, that's why I don't actually say if it's a roof problem, I can, I'm confident in saying you need a roofer if it's a plumbing problem. But if it's like, like you said, there's a couple of examples where you're not too sure, just say professional contractor. And if they license that person in the state and you know about the licensing requirement, that's great. But if I don't like, don't use the word licensed, just professional contractor to fix this. In my experience, at the end of the inspection, when I print out or share electronically the summary of the inspection report, which is the highlights, the major defects only in the summary, um, the real estate agent already knows who's going to fix this. So there's that as well. Like most real estate agents for my clients already know. That's why they only want to see the summary. They don't want to read the report. They want to get to the next step. We have different goals home inspectors and real estate agents. I'm there to educate and tell the story of the home. They're there to get to the closing and that's okay. As long as we both understand what's going on. And so they're going to have a contractor who's going to go through and they're qualified to inspect, um, qualified to fix whatever I put in the re inspection report. Maybe it's one person that can do everything, right? doesn't matter if it's a garbage disposal that's related to plumbing and electrical, they're going to handle it anyways. Hmm. Okay. I really don't care as long as I put in the report what I observe, what that observation means. Is it no big deal? Is it serious with the consequences, right? And then a recommendation to get a qualified contractor to fix it. Or as a homeowner, you can replace the dirty air filter or monitor it, right? Because it could turn into a worse situation. So it's those things, right? You have to write your observation, tell the person what that means and the consequences, right? Like this could, this could turn into mold or something. And then there's water leak or something that could damage structural components. And, and then you need a roofing, a qualified contractor to come in, right? Those three, that's how I think of writing inspection systems. Will a sewer scope course certification ever be available? online through InterNACHI. Yeah. Um, it's not through InterNACHI, it's through our training partner. So our training partner for sewer scopes is a master at sewer scopes. He's the first person to figure out how to put an entire course together with marketing and business practices and coaching. And that's Jim Crum. So go to our certification. I would take the the course. If you can do a live course, we just had a live course at the Colorado House of Horrors. 
Jim runs around the entire country and does sewer scope classes, hands-on classes. If you can get to the House of Horrors in Florida, Pennsylvania, um, in Colorado, you can shove sewer scopes with different camera heads and all that stuff and lengths and, and uh, through pipes throughout the entire House of Horrors. It's so much fun, right, in a controlled environment. Um, he also takes people out to houses and does sewer scopes. Great coach. And he just doesn't tell you how to inspect the pipes from inside with the sewer scope, but he tells you about how to make money on it. It's highly valuable. And he did it from the beginning because he took a course himself to learn and it was so crappy, right? That he had to do it himself. So it took him a year of doing inspections and making mistakes in order to coach others. So he's a certified master inspector. I mean, he's well off and well to do. He's one of the, you know, top performing inspection companies in the world. And he's now in a position to just share. He doesn't care. So he tells everybody all of his trips, uh, tips and secrets. So um, there, and he does an online course. So it's not through Interachi. It's, it's so good. We have to give it to an expert to do it. There may be a fee, but you're going to get that back. Uh, water shutoff valve. Main shutoff supply valve, we already saw these things, but the water shutoff valve is right there. They left a little uh, a hole and you got to reach in there. I can't see the bonding wire and there's no jumping wire. Is Where's the water meter? I have no idea what's going on. So uh, not all that great. Uh, water heating equipment is next. Um, there's a closet. Um, it's louvered. Great. A gas fired hot water heater. You can see the gas valve and the drip and the the TPR valve and the water catch pan. And there's the manufacturing label, the size and the water coming in through a shutoff valve and gas coming in. And there's the vent pipe and um, expansion tank that's leaking and it's not supported well. So that's in my inspection report. This is not the best way to install an expansion tank because if it's waterlogged, uh, I forget how many pounds it's gonna be on this fitting right here, which is like a foot long here. And it's just gonna bend and it's, it's not going to stop leaking. It's not going to stop leaking. Right. Um, and this is already corroding and there's no support on this tank. So there's a way to install an expansion tank and uh, it's usually supported. Um, I don't even like them hanging, but uh, you know, without support. So um, that's just a preference. What are you TPR valves? Uh, there it is there extended to the floor. It's not dripping. If it was dripping, um, that's a defect. It looked like it did in the past. So I'm kind of concerned. I stick my finger up inside. Don't get cut. You know, I'm trying to see and I pull my finger outside. If it's any wet in there, defect. So um, you never want a dripping TPR valve. Interior water supply and all fixtures by running the faucets um, and then flushing all the toilets and all the sinks and tubs and showers for functional drainage and a drain waste, waste vent system um, and any sump pumps. So drain waste vent, I can only see the stack from the top and then everything else is finished. So there's nothing unfinished in this house. I can't see anything, you know, any, any of the pipes. Describe if it's public or private. Public, obviously. Location, describe location of the shot valve. My clients usually see this with me. Um, I'll write it in the re inspection report with a picture and sometimes a video on how to get it. But that's not the easiest, in an emergency, you know, that's not the easiest place. And which way do you turn it? You know, turn it away from you. It's kind of a weird thing. Um, and then there's the crock, uh, the shutoff valve on the outside of the house. Uh, on the, house. Uh, the location of the main fuel shutoff valve, that's at the meter. We already saw these things. There's no storage system. There's no oil tanks. The capacity of water heating equipment, we took a picture of that. It's 50 gallons. That's good. A report in need of correction. Any problems with flushing the toilet and running the sinks and turning on the tub and looking at the shower? That's what I usually do um, when I'm in the bathroom. Uh, deficiencies in the installation of hot and cold water, um, hot on the left, cold on the right. Active plumbing leaks, so we didn't see any. Toilets that were damaged or were loose, uh, nothing like that. Like, you need to figure out what you want to do with your inspection report. You can group the bathrooms together in your inspection report, or you can put them under the category of plumbing. Um, it's really up to you. I like to separate them, so I have bathrooms in my inspection report. I don't actually inspect all the bathrooms together. Uh, it's really part of my interior, but I'll inspect them, you know, uh, and then I put them in a category called bathrooms. And so you've, 
you know, I'm, I'm actually going to do the bathrooms later, but in the standards of practice, this is where there's a bit of an overlap, but the requirements are clear, right? You have to inspect the fixtures by running water and flushing toilets and things like that. So I'm going to flush all the toilets. I'm actually going to do the inspection of the bathrooms later, but this is the pictures according to the, the um, uh, standards of practice. There's GFCIs there too. And the vent doesn't work. There's the master bathroom master bathroom toilets and sinks and shower. And I, I try to push on the tiles of the master bathroom and there's a shower there and the tub, I fill up the, the Whirlpool tub and to turn it on. And there's some caulking that could be some sealant that's needed. And there's an access panel in the hallway on the outside of the bathroom. And there's some things about the, the electrical, you know, the GFCI and within reach and there's some code things and and uh, it's, it's on a good base. Uh, there's the, there it is there. I don't see any water leaks happening, but I'll, I'll turn it on for sure. And then there's the access panel for the mask. And then the full bathroom in the hallway, flush the toilet, sink. I pound on the tile walls in the shower. If my hand goes through, that's fantastic. I'll take a picture of it. I don't, I'm not going to fix the tiles. They were damaged and I found the damage by pushing on it. And the, the drain works and, you know, normal things. And then there was a, a window that was fogged in the bathroom. So that's another one. And then I love pulling open the access panels to the shower because sometimes I find a leak that no one else sees. And then I do electrical, right? So the bathrooms actually come later in the inspection process, but according to the standards of practice, it's kind of like in the plumbing section, right? So now electrical. So what I do, remember in the, before I go to electrical, 336, three, Here's my inspection process, right? This is how I manage my time. This is how I make $1,000 in just a couple of hours. So right now I'm at nine, I started at eight, right? The client shows up at eight. I get there early, I do the roof, and then I do the exterior, and then I do the heavy lifting, the HVAC, plumbing, drain waste vent, hot water tank, we did those. 9.15 to 10 a.m., I'm doing electrical and foundation, that's next. And then when I get to the attic, I hopefully I'm at about 10 o'clock when I hit the attic. So let's go back and let's see what's going on at the electrical. So we're at the electrical, right? I'm required to inspect all these things in electrical. It seems overwhelming, but it's not, not really. There's a service drop. I really don't have a service drop. It's underground service, right? So what is a service drop? Terminology is really important. And then terminology related to electrical service components is available in InterNACHI's free online how to perform residential electrical inspections course. I know master inspectors who are not using the right terminology. And you read their reports and they're all like, well, the wires overhead, no, they're not, you know. So you have to get, you know, what is a service entrance cable? And what is a service drop? And what are conductors? When you say a conductor, like, we go over these things. So over here, you could see service mast. There's a service mast, right? Service lateral, electrical meter, service entrance cable. We go over all these things. We teach you what they are, right? And we teach you what these things are. I don't have this at, at this house, right? I'll show you what I have. Where are we? There's the course. Service drop. Okay. I'm required to inspect the service drop. I don't have overhead service conductors and attachment. I don't have that. Service head, gooseneck, and drip loops. I don't have that. Service mass, service conduit, race. Blah, blah, blah. Here's what I have electric meter attached to the side of the house. And sometimes I like to grab this meter right about here and try to pull it off the house. If it pulls off the house, that's fantastic. Take a picture of it. It's a defect, a material defect, really. There's no service mass, but there is an underground conduit in this inspection picture. It's next coming up. And there's a service entrance cable going out of the meter out of the back end through the brick wall, heading to the main disconnect at the main electrical panel board. And we'll see that. I'm required to inspect the meter in the base, right? I like to try to pull that off, right? It's kind of fun. I can see the, the screws, there are attachments right there in the brick. And sometimes it's loose. You don't want that. Service entrance conductors in there. So I can't see that, but here's my underground. It's cable going through. That should be sealed up, right? And what's that? Hmm. There's a picture there. Main disconnect. So this 
panel is in the garage and the main disconnect is that. That's the main disconnect there. And it's two fingers, a blurry picture. Sometimes that happens. Two fingers means 200 amps. One finger is 100 amps. One and a half fingers is um, 150. So the main disconnect must be clearly marked and it was. The main disconnect must be either inside or outside the house as close to the service conductors where they enter the house and the, for sure here, it's on the other side of the wall. It can't be in a bathroom. Can't have panels, disconnects in a bathroom. No panels, no breakers in a bathroom. No more than six breakers can be used to disconnect the service, right? So we've got one main one here. I'm required to inspect panel boards and overcurrent protection devices, circuit breakers and fuses. So there's the main panel there. You're not required to remove the dead front cover, at least in my area, Pennsylvania, Colorado, many states across that. I think there's one state that requires you could be Texas. They're crazy down there. Got, this is an old panel, old inspection. Got one GFCI in the panel and it's already tripped. Why? Oh, that was me. I tripped the exterior, remember? The little GFCI, exterior, brick wall. So I tripped that and I need to reset it. And then I can test it right there as well. Now, what if I take a picture of the panel and one of these breakers is in the trip position and it's not the GFCI. It's like a 20 amp breaker that goes to the kitchen or something, or it's, um, 20 amp, uh, it's just, it's in the bedroom, 15 amp breaker for the, one of the bedrooms things. And it's tripped off. It's not an AFCI, it's something else. Should I reset it? Mm -mm. I'm not resetting that. It tripped on purpose. I'm going to put it in the inspection report, say this breaker is tripped. I'm not resetting it. It tripped for a reason, right? What if a breaker is in the off position? Should I turn it back on for people? Like maybe the, the pilot in the, in the, when the appliances is the fireplace is off. Should I light it? The pilot? Should I, oh, the gas shutoff valve is off and the pilot is off. I'm going to turn it on, right? So I'll turn the gas on and turn the light to pilot and see what happens. No. You don't turn th things on. Oh, the main water shelf valve is on. Should I turn it on? Nope. You're supposed to prep the owner of the property and make sure certain things are on. All electricity is on. All the water is on. The heating is on. The cooling is on. Um, we're going to run water. So, you know, all the drainage systems or the septic system or so, everything's ready to go, right? And if something's off, well, don't turn it on. So I took a look. And let's say this breaker is off, right? It's actually connected. You definitely don't want to turn it on. Sometimes it's off and it's not even connected to any, any wires, right? So that's in the trip position. And we've got two open, two knockouts without caps. So you can stick your finger right there and have a terrible day, right? You could die. So you don't want this. You want this capped off. It could kill you. And it's about five dollars, uh, a dollar fix, right? And maybe an electrician should do it. So now we need an electrician. We need the HVAC. We need a roofer, kickouts, HVAC technician, an electrician. Yeah, we need some contractors to come. These are not difficult things. I'm missing screws, panel screws. Now there's only two holding up this panel. There's two missing. I'm looking at the wiring, looking for overfusing. I, I don't want a big fat breaker, 20 amp breaker on a very thin gauge wire. Overfusing, bonding, wires, grounding, service. Yeah. Terminals. Uh, I see a doorbell inside the panel. I don't like that. Everything's okay. Service and grounding. Got that. Got that. Service and uh, ground, service grounding and bonding. Got that. I can't see if it's bonded to the water line. Can't even get to the water, you know, the meter or the shutoff valve. I don't even know where the meter is. I haven't figured that out. But bonding is required. We're needed to ensure electrical continuity and the ability to carry a fault current to a path to grounding. And the metal water pipe must be bonded to the service equipment enclosure. 
So I don't know about that. There's certain things I just can't see. And there's the rod there for grounding. The upper end of the electrode should be flush with the ground or just below the ground surface so that the end and attachment are protected from damage. So if you find a rod sticking up out of the ground, that's a defect. It should be at or just below the soil surface and the inspection image there, the rod is visible. And you can go to the Internachi How to Perform an Electrical Inspection course and learn about grounding and bonding. It's difficult for a lot of inspectors to understand. So we break it down very easy. What is grounding? Give examples of grounding, show what an electrode is and all the different types, the rods, the diameters, the length, how it's installed, what an attachment is, proper and not proper, jumpers, oofers, <laughs> ground plates, still framing. Like we go over and the diameters and sizes. And then we go over bonding, bonding components, right? And then panel enclosures. So if you're weak in anything, we got you. Just go to Internachi and take a course and strengthen that knowledge. So electrical bonding and grounding training for home inspectors is available in our free online course. You're required to inspect a representative number of switches, light fixtures, and receptacles, including AFCIs, where possible. You're not required to inspect them all. So uh, turn on light fixtures, ceiling fixtures, wall receptacles. Everything's kind of finished. All ground fault circuit interrupters you can get to, you know, where possible. Use the tester. So there's one there, bathroom, and that was connected to the exterior and the bathroom's there. And the presence for smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. So I test the smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. Smoke alarms must be powered by the building wiring and a battery backup. They should be interconnected so that when one alarm activates, all of them do. In each bedroom, outside of each sleeping area, and on each story of the basement, including the basement. On each story, including, but there's no basement here. Old smoke detectors really should be updated. This one is hardwired, no battery backup. And they're not interconnected. It's not much you can do there without a lot of work, but at least you should have a battery backup. Carbon monoxide detectors are required for houses that have a fuel fired appliance or an attached garage with an opening to the house. Outside of each bedroom, inside of each bedroom with a fuel burning appliance and interconnected. So we got a fireplace here. We saw the chimney on the top, right? Brand new chimney cap. The inspector shall describe the main service disconnects amperage rating if labeled. We got 200 amps, there's the two fingers, and the type of wiring observed. You have to report as in need of correction, any deficiencies in the conductors, service entry conductors, drip loop or clearances, clearances, any unused circuit breaker panel openings that was not filled, got two of them. Any tested receptacle that didn't work properly, right? Including GFCIs and the absence of carbon monoxide detectors and smoke detectors. Next system is foundation. According to the standards of practice, I have to inspect the foundation and there's no foundation. Well, there is a foundation, a slab on grade, right? So I'm looking for any kind of movement, cracking, maybe tiles or something like that. I'm not required to inspect under carpeting or under finished floor areas or anything like that. I don't have any uh, beams, any structural components, nothing. On it. We saw a crack in the brick veneer above the entry door. That's about it, right? And I'm supposed to describe the type of foundation and access to an underfloor crawl space if there is one. If you're weak on structural problems, we got a textbook, college textbook, structural issues for home inspectors. You can download it uh, as electronic or you can buy the printed copy or you can search for concrete at the top right corner of natchi.org. You go to natchi.org, any natchi.org page, top right corner, use the search and type in concrete. We got the history of concrete, we got reinforced concrete, concrete admixtures, visual inspection of concrete, shrinkage cracks in concrete, concrete tiles. There's a lot of training about concrete. Free online course about structural issues for home inspector. That's a really good course. And we go through uh, an inspection that I did of a poured concrete foundation wall reinforced with cracks in it. And we distinguish what the cracks are all about. Some of them are good, some of them are bad, some of them are dry, some of them have water coming through. And some of them are patched with epoxy. It's a good course. You can never stop learning. According to the Home Inspection Standards of Practice, you're supposed to report as a need of correction certain observed defects 
and we go through them, especially indications of active water penetration. Now I'm at the attic and it should be, if I have an eight o'clock inspection, should be about 10 right now. If it's 10 o'clock, I know I'm on time. I'm managing my time well. I've got about an hour left before I get paid. So we're doing well in the company. If I'm in the attic at 10 o'clock, you can also check on your other inspectors, call them up, text them. Hey, where are you? Should be in the attic right now, aren't you? Yeah. Okay. You're doing good. Talk to you later. The inspector shall inspect all unfinished spaces, including attics and crawl spaces for insulation, ventilation, and mechanical, mechanical exhaust systems. Here's the attic. It's a door that's not insulated, not weather stripped. It's not an exterior door. It's an interior door going to an unfinished attic space in a cold climate. I mean, this is just a hole in the wall. So you can see it from the other side. It's just crazy. I mean, the second floor must be a different climate, in the, especially in the winter. Well, anyways, that's a defect. And it's a way to save home energy too. So I'm going to have a couple of things about doors and unfinished attic panels and doorways that go into an unfinished space that, that is not insulated or weather tight or anything like that. So it's just like, I don't have to write anything. I already wrote these things out and I just have to select it on my mobile device, that sentence with a picture or two or three. I see fiberglass insulation and trust built. It's filled with stuff, so I can't see everything. And I think the storage is compressing the insulation on the floor. It's falling in, it's a little disheveled. No roof leaks, no structural problems. Mechanical exhaust systems in the kitchen, bathrooms, and laundry area. Yep. So there's a recycling. This uh, vent system over the stove is in the microwave and it doesn't exhaust outside. The bathroom fan doesn't work. Um, and then the exhaust system for the laundry um, is there and it goes outside. I'm supposed to ins inspect and describe the type of insulation and the proximate depth. So that's very easy to do and report as a need of correction, anything that's absent with the insulation. Now I'm doing the interior and I'm finishing up. So I do roof, exterior, and then the big systems, HVAC, plumbing, drain waste vents, hot water source. I do the electrical and then the structure. That was very easy. I get up into the attic about 10 o'clock and now I'm down from the attic. If it's hot, I'm sweating. I'm ready to go anyways. So I only have a little bit of time left. Half hour, I should be done with the interior. And the interior is representative of a number of windows and doors and wall receptacles and switches and lights and bedrooms and things like that interior. And it also includes the bathrooms. Now the bathrooms in my inspection report are in a different section. So, but in the standards of practice, they appear earlier in the plumbing. That's okay. I can do it. I do all the bathrooms. I get down to the interior uh, of the first floor, the fireplace. That's another section of my inspection report. And then the garage. And then I end up in the kitchen to finish everything up and get paid. That's where I'm heading. And I'm feeling pretty good because I know what this house is all about. And I'm writing my inspection report after every system. I'm done, completely done with writing the report, inspecting, writing the report, and adding the photos. And now I'm on the interior and I'm heading to the finish line, right? Probably working up an appetite and I'm looking forward to lunch, right? I'm going to eat it while driving to the next inspection because I want to be there early, just like the first inspection. Representative number of wall receptacles. The interior is finished. There's nothing. I can't see any structural anything. So I'm just going through the interior. There's a lot of stuff that is in my way. I'm not moving furniture. There could be a major defect behind this big cabinet. There could be a hole in the wall. But again, we talked about what I'm required to do. If I do not see a hole in the wall, I'm not responsible for it. So I like taking pictures of inspection restrictions. I'm looking at everything. Now I get to the skylights. Remember the skylights? Some of them were sealed with some sealant. <laughs> ah, railings. Now this house is older. It was built to code, but this railing isn't safe for a kid. 
And if my client has a crawling kid, right? One, two years old, three years old, they're going to get their head stuck in there. They may even fall through. It is a safety hazard. The real estate agent will say something. Usually this house was built 20 years ago. What are you talking about modern code for? Well, I'm not a code inspector, but this is not safe. And code usually is revised when someone gets hurt, like a firefighter or a contractor or a homeowner, and kids would fall through or get their head stuck in here. When the space between the spin spindles of a railing like this, a guard, is large enough for a child to fall through, that's what they did, unfortunately. So code said, that's not safe anymore. We need to tighten this space up. You can't, now it's, you can't put a four inch diameter sphere between the space of the spindles. If you can, it's not safe. And so as a home inspector, not a code inspector, I inspect a home without any regard to when the home was built. And this is your call. And this is a discussion you want to have with your attorney, your local business attorney as well. Because I want to be able to find problems that are not safe and put them into my inspection report as a recommendation for correction. And this is one of them. Because most homes that I inspect were built a while back. On average, my home inspections were 15 to 20 year old homes. And they were built to code back then, which doesn't mean anything today. Because this was built to code back then, but today it's a safety hazard. Because we have learned better. People have gotten hurt. And the standards have changed for good reason. And so I, as a home inspector, call this out as a defect. I can probably tell you when the code for a particular system or component was okay, but it doesn't matter. I'm not a code inspector. I'm a home inspector. And I'm citing on the safety of my client. So go for it, I would say. If you see a defect, it's a defect. A defect is a defect. A safety hazard is a safety hazard. It doesn't matter when that system or component became a safety hazard or not because the code changed. It doesn't matter. It's, if it's currently a safety hazard, call it out. But remember, you're not a code inspector either. It's, it's a little challenging when it comes to those type of issues, but usually, a home inspection is a lot of fun because <laughs> you're not a code inspector. You ever see a code book? It's that thick. It's three inches thick. The code inspectors, oh, that's tough to be a code inspector, but a home inspector is fairly easy. It's actually fairly, fairly reasonable, fairly straightforward in learning how to perform a home inspection. What's difficult is um, the marketing and business aspects. And internet actually provides all the resources you need to be a successful home inspector, which is really a, sex, a successful business owner who just happens to do home inspections. We provide those resources like the home inspection business course, chapter 11 on how to figure out a profitable inspection fee and the resources like a free online inspection agreement system and legal documents like a legal zoom for home inspectors. We have all of these things for you to be successful successful business owner. I got some cracks in the tile, beautiful tile. In the tile floor, there's a lot of cracks. Older home, no big deal. So what I do is I just, I knock, I knock on the tile. And if I hear one tile is loose, then I might call that out. This tile's loose. If it's loose in my, if I, can get my fingernails in there and that crack and pull the tile out, I will. But I'm just looking to see, you know, using my fingers to see if it's loose. And if it's loose, I'll call it out. If it's not loose, I'm going to mention that there are hairline cracks in the tile in various places. That's about it. 
I'm pulling on this nose of the wooden stair because it seemed a little loose. So I don't want it to be loose because someone, the nose of a stair is actually critical. Um, people have tripped and fallen, right? And there you go. It's like code, right? What's, what is a nose on a stair? It's part of the, it's actually identified in the code about stairs because it's such a critical thing. Stairs have been like this thing that has changed and now it's pretty stable. The code and the standards for steps, risers, treads, railings, handrails, guards, lighting, um, they're pretty standardized now, but some old homes, some historic homes don't follow those codes anymore. And people used to tumble down. My grandmother, my grandmother's on my wife's side, her stairs were almost vertical, right? And then people kept falling down and they changed the code in order to make it safer. And now that's the standard. So if you see something that's off the standard, maybe call it out. So I was paying attention to this nose. I don't want it to be loose. Got some fogged window panes. Remember the skylights? Well, we've got windows in the bedrooms too. There's one window with a fogged window pane. There's two panes that could be replaced. And there's three panes. If it's cracked, that's a major safety hazard. If it's fogged, um, it's really cosmetic. That's how I treated it. And interior. I'm looking for indications of active water leaks. Right? It's in the standards twice. Active water leaks under plumbing and under roof. This could be a roof leak. This is a second floor ceiling. There's a watermark. I mean, that's a watermark. Now, is it active or not? Well, I have a moisture meter. Oh, I'll show it to you. Well, the one thing I could do is use infrared. So this is a FLIR infrared camera. You can get it an inspector outlet. This is a, like a $500 thing that will provide overwhelming value to your clients. It'll make you a better inspector too, because with infrared, you can see things that other inspectors can't. And you put those infrared images on your website, right? Natchee.org slash website in order to distinguish yourself from all the rest. And it helps you become a better home inspector. And I'll take a look at that watermark with my infrared camera, see if it shows any anomalies. There's another type of infrared camera. I like three or other infrared cameras. And then uh, I've got this moisture meter. Um, I don't measure anything. I don't use the other type of moisture meters, like a, uh, well, the other ones. I like this one. You see that? So it has these probes and I'll stick it up there. And if it goes off, well, then it's wet. If it doesn't go off and my infrared doesn't show any anomalies, it might still be active roof leak. All I see is indications of an active roof leak. They could have painted it over. They didn't. They fixed the roof. Is this still a problem? I don't know. I'm going to tell my client. Look, I have indications of an active roof leak. It could be dry. It could be from 10 years ago. I don't know. No one knows. Let's ask the seller. Maybe it's already in the seller's disclosure. Maybe not. It's about all I can do. But I'm not going to say, all good here. This is an indication of a roof leak that was in the past. It's active and dry. It happened a long time ago and they just didn't paint over it, I don't know. So I'm going to side on my client and I'm going to, I'm going to be conservative. I'm going to say, client, you have to ask for more information because here's what we see. I'll take a picture of it. I'll try to measure it. But if it's not, see that? Look, there's rings around that thing. Maybe that's what caused the roof to be replaced or the chimney flashing. I don't know. But whenever I see this, kind of treat it as an active roof leak until someone can tell my client otherwise. That's just a tip. Here's another thing. I've got drywall damage at the corner bead, metal corner bead, that usually pops when it gets wet or hit. This is in the ceiling, so it wasn't physically damaged. I see watermarks on the wallpaper and there's various rings of watermarks, just like this one. There's various rings of watermarks on the ceiling. There's various rings of watermarks, streaks coming from this corner. What is this corner? Ah, it's associated with something from the roof, I think. I don't know. There's another one. Oh, there's a corner bead, water, cracking, drywall damage. What the heck is going on here? There's all these water. There's more cracks. 
maybe this is a settlement crack, but what, why would it be a watermark? I don't know. This is the, this is the attic space up here. Remember that unfinished attic space? Maybe something happened. Oh, unfinished attic space. Maybe the roof leaked through the attic, came through the insulation, came through here. I don't know what the story is, right? I could spend all day trying to investigate it, but that's not my job. I'm just going to observe, report my observations and make some recommendations. I'm going to tell my client, if you leave this go, it could be a major problem, maybe even a structural problem. Look at this watermark here, crack in the drywall, and this is the skylight. Well, the roof looked great. The skylight, one of them had some sealant on it, but I'm not sure. Maybe the seller knows. There's more watermarks on the wallpaper. Like, what the heck? Boy, they really let that first roof go. And I think this is all dry and just indications of an old roof leak that went crazy and was leaking all over the place. And they the finally, like maybe the house sold, was selling and the listing agent was like, we have to get, we have to replace this and we're going to disclose. But I don't know why they wouldn't paint. Why won't, don't, don't you patch up and paint things? You know, a home inspection is going to, you know, sell, buyers. Look at this, another one. Watermarks, rings, crack, drywall damage. Another one. I mean, what is going on with the skylights? So I don't know. It's not, I don't have to stay there, investigate and diagnose. That's not what a home inspection is not an exhaustive search for defects. I'm not required to report upon why there are defects or what is causing problems. Again, you are required to report upon the defects that you both observe and deem to be material on the day of the inspection. It's not a prediction of future events and it's not uh, a description of what happened in the past. Got a railing, same thing, space between the spindles, too far apart. It was built to code. I don't care. Like it's not just not safe anymore. It's like bedrooms without AFCIs, right? That's the modern standard. It's like garage without any GFCI protection. It's like kitchen counters, right? The code has changed. Like it used to be, remember the six feet from the sink should, should have GFCI protection. Well, now they, it's just like everything, everything and every counter doesn't even matter if it's across the room without any sink, kitchen counter, all Kitchen counters should be GFCI protected. Kitchen counter receptacles, receptacles on the kitchen counter should be GFCI protected, right? Okay. It was built without GFCIs. Okay. Uh, fireplace. So there's a fireplace here, wood burning fireplace. We saw the chimney, it's all new. We have to inspect certain things, readily accessible and visible portions of a fireplace and chimneys, lintels above the fireplace openings, masonry stone it's really important damper doors by opening and closing them if you can and clean out doors and frames okay there's that okay it's uh not masonry it's a factory built fireplace these are panels these are not actual real bricks um they can be damaged so i want to touch them and see if they're secure and not cracked open we don't want any cracks opening cracks and then there's the damper you're not required to inspect the flu of anything uh, of any hot water tank or or um, heating system or fireplace, but I took a picture with my camera because I can, and that's the flue going up and that's a damper door and then the clean out doors and frames. Great. Inspectors shall describe the type of fireplace and report um, evidence of, there's a fireplace, wood burning fireplace, um, factory built, evidence of joint separation, damage, deterioration, hearth, hearth extension, chambers, um, Damper doors that didn't open, lack of smoke detectors, lack of carbon monoxide detectors, clean outs not made of metal. So we're not done yet. I'm inspecting in here. So warm air is supposed to, air is supposed to wrap around this factory built fireplace and warm air is supposed to come out the top. So I take a look in there and I see what? Rust. It's not just rust or surface rust. It's major rust. You can see there's structural damage to the metal material itself. Look at that. Like I can't get my, uh, the most frustrating thing is when you take um, really good pictures, but they're blurry because it just won't focus. I'm trying to go through a screen that remember the screen here, I'm trying to get my camera lens 
to poke through the screen so we can take pictures of this. I, mean, I can't get it focused, but this is a major problem. And I don't understand why, because that's new. That's new. The top is new. This is fantastic, but not that. This is a material defect, right? We have a serious problem. We have an indication of a active roof leak or prior roof leak that has caused resulted major structural damage to the fireplace itself. This is a fuel burning fireplace, a wood, solid wood burning fireplace. And there's smoke issues. There's health and safety issues, indoor air quality issues. There's carbon monoxide issues. This is a major problem, right? Uh, it was fixed. The water problem was fixed, right? The chimney top was replaced. Okay. The flashing was okay, but this wasn't fixed. This is still ex existing. It's like the, the space between the spindles of the guardrail, right? It's still a safety hazard. doesn't matter when it was built, right? And this is a still a safety hazard. This is a, this is a material defect. It may have been 10 years ago, or maybe the roof was replaced and the chimney was fixed last year or just recently, but no one fixed this, right? And if it's, here's the, here's the thing. If it's rusted and corroded terribly down here, guess what it is all the way up the flue. It's probably just as bad. Oh, so when I tell my clients bad news, <laughs> I tend to have a smile on my face and it's sometimes for the wrong reasons, because this is exciting to me. If you're into home inspections and you see this, this is fantastic. What a great story. This is going to be in the next chapter meeting, right? It's fantastic. Everything will look great on the outside, on the roof, coming down, nothing wrong. And then I look through the screen with my flashlight and, uh, and then I'm imagining all the rust going all the way up the chimney. This is so much fun. This is why I get a smile on my face and I go to my client, here's what I want to show you. And I describe, I tell the story of this, right? And we need, we need some help. We need someone to remove this and test maybe a chimney sweep, maybe somebody else. I don't know. I think a chimney sweep, certified chimney sweep can do it. So um, that's what the standards of practice helps you with. It makes you inspect things um that can uh help you find defects it's not a guarantee there's no guarantee you'll find defects you may not even see them that's okay if you don't see defects it's not gonna it's not gonna be in the report but if you do see it if you follow an inspection process and you look a little bit closer oh, you can really help out your clients right garage is next remember this is the interior attic interior fireplace garage kitchen Heading to the kitchen next. I kind of slowed down because this is a really cool defect at the fireplace, right? That was pretty cool. So heading to the garage. Is it manually operated or automatically operated? It's automatic. I got a button. It goes up and down and it's uh, plugged in and secure. And I, I trip the laser eyes. There's actually 10 steps to performing a, an inspection of a, a garage door opener. And we have a course on that and a checklist that you can upload into your inspection software and customize it to your inspection process, right? So the walls are good, the floor is good. And then I turn to my left and I see, oh, the structure is made out of concrete block. There's concrete block all the way up, up to the roof line. And there's a step crack in the garage. Hmm. Uh, test the GFCI and it works. I have to reset it. Remember it's in the, in the panel and then frost free hose bib. There's no frost free hose bib. It gets kind of cold in the garage. Should be a frost free hose bib. And then like that is now growing. Like it goes from the top and it's stepped the major crack of the garage. This is the structure concrete block and it's step crack and it's cracking through everything. It's cracking through the block itself in different areas right here. There's a crack, a hairline crack. It doesn't show up in the picture. There's a hairline crack here. There's a mortar crack here. There's a crack going this way and there's a crack down. So it's going vertical and stepping and going through the mortar joints and the concrete block. Oh, you know, and it's starting to separate. You can put a coin in that 
crack. Uh, take a close up picture. Yeah. Uh, and I put a, a pen next to it just for scale. So I can stick my pen in there. It's a major crack. Oh, it goes up and it's wider at the top than it is at the bottom. Look how large this crack is. It's moving too. When did it crack? When did it move? I have no idea. Is there water coming through it? No. Is it separated? Yeah. It's starting to move. Is it different? Like, is it going wider at the top than it? Yeah. Is it uh, indicating where the settlement is? Yeah. It usually follows the crack. It's pointing, the crack here is pointing to the where the settlement is. Do you have other indications of the settlement? Oh, now I've got the settlement at the front door. That's really the brick. I'm not sure if it's related. Probably not. But now I have two areas, right? You can have somebody come over and just take a look at the structural cracks. And maybe this neighborhood moves a little bit. Maybe the entire neighborhood just moves a little bit with it and everyone's okay with it. And this, there's been structural engineers that have come around to the other neighbors and they've taken a look and everything's thumbs up. And they've already written a report for the neighborhood. Maybe there's an HOA. I don't know. Not, it's not my job. So I'm going to recommend a structural engineer come because I've got a quarter inch crack. I mean, I took out my measuring tape. I used a pen for scale. I'm using my finger to show things. And it doesn't matter if it's in focus or not. This is major movement. It's enough for me. Enough for me. I love the house. It's a dream house. This isn't a killer deal. We just need some more information that I cannot provide. So I'm making a recommendation. I have my observation. I explain my observation in my report. My client is with me. Agent is with me. And I'm telling what may happen. Like if, if this is still moving, you can measure it. If it's still moving, what could happen? You have structural movement and that doesn't, that isn't any good. What should we do? We need further information. What should we start with? Asking the seller. Let's look at the seller disclosure. Let's ask the seller. Let's ask the neighbors. Let's see if we can get more information. And then worst case scenario is structural engineer. And we take it from there. Ah, oh, I feel much better. It can still go. The deal is probably going to still go through. It's a dream home, but we just need more information. And when you come across a structural problem like this, do not go soft. If you see a defect, man, you put it in the report and you make some explanation of of the consequences and you make a recommendation for further evaluation by a professional or correction because you know it's wrong. So we've got some things, right? If you think about where we are now, we have some things with the house. We've got some kickout flashing. We've got some, we got a new roof, but we got water marks all over the place. We've got a skylight that has some sealant. I don't know. Looks like it could be leaking, maybe not. We got some watermarks that need to be explained. We got a structural problem over the front door and definitely at the in the garage. We've got electrical uh, outlets, um, caps that are missing. Um, what else? Uh, we have a dry watermark on, underneath the TPR valve of the hot water tank. What else? Can you think of anything else? We have a door to the attic that is just not insulated. It's like you might as well just not even close it. There's so much energy loss through that door to the attic. Okay, oh, we have a safety hazard because a child can fall through the railing. Anything else? Well, we get to the garage door. Oh, it was built to code back then. Yeah, but um, a fire can still blow through this door in a minute because it's not fire rated. It's a hollow core door with a piece of, st of steel on one side, right? Sheet metal on one side. And so like you can't have any openings from a garage directly into a bedroom for sure. Cause people sleeping just won't wake up. So that's the one thing you have to know. You can't go from a garage into a bedroom can't. Now, the other openings between a garage and a house must have a solid wood door or a solid or honeycomb core steel door 
at least one and three eighths inch thick or a 20 minute rated fire rated door. And that door has to be equipped with a self-closing device. And I love it when it latches all by itself. The opening from a private garage to a room that is used for sleeping. What's that mean, sleeping? Well, a bedroom, a guest room, a habitable space or a living space. You can sleep in a habitable space. You can sleep in a living space. You can sleep in a guest room. You can sleep in a bedroom. It's the sleeping that, you know, because carbon monoxide can overwhelm a person that's sleeping. They just don't wake up. So when you have an opening from a private garage to a room that is used for sleeping, and that's a bedroom, guest room, habitable space, or a living space, it's just not permitted. You can't have a doorway or opening between a garage and a space that can be used for sleeping. There's various ways you can say this in your inspection report to get the point across. You just can't have this, right? This is a safety hazard and a material defect. A guest room is a room used by or intended to be used by a guest for living and sleeping. A habitable space is a space that is used for living, sleeping, eating, or cooking. Bathrooms, a toilet room, closets, a hallway, storage areas, they're not considered habitable spaces. But a living space is a space used for living, sleeping, eating, cooking, bathing, or washing. This is where you get into code. And when you get into a garage and there's a door in between the house and the garage, you ought to know a little bit more than you need to know in order to do a good inspection. And maybe your inspection is going to save that structure from a fire or, and, or save someone's life, right? So we have those resources for you and they're free and online and provided by the only tuition-free home inspector college on the planet, internationally.edu. So if you're kind of like, mm, I don't know enough about this, we can help, right? So you can do a great inspection. So the inspector shall report and is in need of correction and proper spacing between balusters. We talked about that photoelectric eyes, any window that was fogged or displayed. So we have that intermediate space, right? Intermediate balusters, the spindles, the space between the spindles is large enough for a child to fall through. It should not allow a four inch sphere to pass through. Photoelectric eyes that didn't operate properly, everything's good there. Any window that was obviously fogged or displayed evidence of broken seals, we got three of those and two skylights. Laundry, I forgot the laundry. That's part of the interior. This is a five minute inspection at most. Clothes washer, dryer, water catch pan underneath both. I like that. It's made out of metal. Great. There's the water supply hoses, braided, metal, mesh, pressure tested. Fantastic. GFCI protection is needed. And there's the catch pan. That's fantastic. I'm in the kitchen. You may want to include the kitchen in the interior section of your report or as a separate section. I do a separate. There's the kitchen. Fantastic. Run water, garbage disposal, no leaks. GFCI is not working. I don't care when the house was built. There, we need GFCI protection at the kitchen counter. Receptacles. I turn on the dishwasher. It didn't leak. I turn on the stove, touch the top burners. They all work. Um, oven, that's me touching the oven elements. Don't do that if, unless you know what you're doing. And then I test the microwave to make sure it works. And then I do a report summary and review. And that's coming next. Question, Todd will comment on the doorbell. Yeah, so we uh, learned our lesson. We uh, had a doorbell that didn't work when our clients moved in, they called us and we're like, mm, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna force every inspector to ring the doorbell as they go through the front door, right? So that's what we do now, we ring the doorbell. It's actually not part of the home inspection according to the standards of practice, but we do it. Um, if there was a screw in the dead front panel that was not correct, would you not open the, I open the panel. It's very dangerous. It's not required. It's kind of like the roof. Um, one of the most dangerous things I ever did to an electrical panel, I removed the dead front cover and I, I removed it. I knew something was wrong. Uh, There's just scorching all over the place. And I turned the panel cover around and this side of the panel was scorched. It was like burnt, right? So something touched the panel. 
and I don't know. So I left the panel off. Um, because you could see something was there was a there was a connection at the main lungs that was not right. I didn't know what was going on. And maybe it caused a spark, maybe it didn't. I don't know. I can't uh, cause a fire. Uh, we need an electrician to come immediately. And it was in the laundry, so I closed the door. Um, I couldn't lock it, but I I remember tying something around it and then notifying everybody, the occupants, the listing agent, the buyer's agent. So there was a there's an electrical panel hazard in the laundry room. Don't go in it. We need an electrician here immediately. I can't fix the problem. There's a problem I'm observing and I can't fix it. We need an electrician here. And it's a safety, current safety hazard. We can't let people live here. I uh, can't let anybody go in the uh, laundry room. You know, you can get electrocuted. Remember that once. That kind of, you know, and when you slip on a roof, that's not fun either. You kind of learn your lesson. But you do these things to exceed the standards of practice and you're not required to. You're not required to remove the dead front cover. You're not required to get upon any roof according to the International Home Inspection Standards of Practice. Now you may be in a regulated state or province or country that requires you to do some things and you have to follow local Regula <clears throat> local regulations because local regulations overrule national ones. Okay. So you have to follow whatever your state or province or township requires. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Yolanda, if the garage is converted into a bedroom, does the fire rated doors requirements still apply? And in line with that, does the internet actually have videos about inspecting converted garages? Converted garages. Um, I can't remember if I've ever inspected a converted garage. My neighbor's done it. <laughs> Chris is converting his garage right now. Huh. Good question. I'd have to think about that. Let me think about that. Or unless somebody wants to answer that right now. Um, yeah. Keith says he's in Texas. His standards of practice is more intensive than internet. He's absolutely. Because internet cheese is this broad one that wraps around the entire globe, right? So ours can be easily overruled by a local. You should follow your state uh, guidelines. Like Florida has their own standards of practice. North Carolina has their own standards of practice. Ohio has their own standards of practice. Um, uh, what, Texas has, it, I go and go on and on, Arizona. And they're all um, usually more uh, exhaustive and intensive. I love the Texas standards of practice. We have a Texas standards of practice course, online course, and they go through appliances. They have a checklist for every system in the house, even kitchen appliances. Like what do you inspect for kitchen appliances? That's fantastic. It's in a course. It's really good. Uh, okay. Already? Okay. No more questions? Okay. We're at the report. This is the report. We're just going to blow through this. And let's end this thing, okay? I'm getting hungry for lunch. Uh, home inspection report. Uh, it kind of looks like this. I just want to show you what my inspection report looks like, right? So um, that's my inspection report. And there's table of contents. There's some general information. What really matters in a home inspection? Trying to set my client's expectations. Just before they get into the gist of my report, like I'm going to tell them what really matters. And the four things that really matters in a home inspection are this, major defects. An example would be a significant structural failure. We have that. Things that may lead to major defects, a small water leak coming from a piece of flashing. We have that in this inspection. Things that may hinder your ability to finance, legally occupy or insure the home, like structural damage caused by termite infestation. We don't have that. And safety hazards, such as lack of GFCI protection. We have that. We have that in the kitchen. We got the railing, smoke detectors. Those are what really matter. Everything else doesn't really matter. Anything in those categories should be corrected, ideally before you move in. And refer to this uh, seller's disclosure. I got an introduction, got scope, definitions, compliance statement. I have an introduction that says like, fix things before you move in because um, if you don't, um, it's just gonna, that's just a dumb idea. <laughs> so try to fix things like um, the water leak problem. 
like follow my recommendations. That's what it is. Follow my recommendations at this moment, because you can ask for further evaluation, like the cracks in the garage can be further evaluated by a structural engineer before you move in. Like if you move in and then go backwards through my report, like a year later, and let's take a look at that uh, fireplace, it might be too late. So try to take action of some sort, either get it corrected or further evaluated or something like that. Take further action before you move in. Get enough money maybe deducted so that if it isn't corrected before you move in, you have some funds to fix it properly after you move in. Something has to be done. I want them to understand that I'm making a report with recommendations to take action and they ought to take those recommendations seriously. That's, that's the gist of my report. Can't go back. Can't call me up and say, you know, we've, we've found problems. It's your responsibility. No, it's not my responsibility. My responsibility ends. Yeah. Unless there's some kind of state legal thing, right? I'm trying to set my client's expectations that now is the time to address things, especially that are written in the report. So here's pictures, love pictures. People love pictures and there's the fireplace, right? And that is a major problem. Correction and further evaluation is recommended. There's pictures of me stepping on my roof. Remember we talked about branding, which is that unique selling point, which is that thing that distinguishes you from all the rest, which helps answer the question, why should I hire you than some other inspector who does the same thing? Because essentially we're all doing the same thing. We're all performing home inspections according to a standards of practice. We're doing the same thing. Now, if we're all doing the same thing, what makes me different from all the rest? If I have a state license, like in Texas, a state home inspector license is meaningless. It doesn't mean a thing. It means that you hold the same piece of paper as everybody else. Does that mean you're a really good home inspector? No. Does that mean you're a terrible home? No. Does that mean you can find, I don't know. It doesn't mean anything. It means you're at the same absolute minimum level that is legally required to conduct a home inspection. That is a low bar. If you hold a license, good luck. There's no guarantee that you're going to be there next year. If you have a certification, that doesn't mean a thing. That doesn't mean a thing. It doesn't mean you're going to be a successful business owner. Third of all businesses go out of business in the first two years. It's because a lot of home inspectors think if they're really good at doing home inspections, that's all they need. You have to be, you have to be good at everything, especially marketing and business. You have to stay in business with good strategies, processes, systematized processes. You have to be great at marketing. You have to tell people how great your inspection business is. You have to tell people, communicate what solutions you solve, you, what solutions you provide to what problems, what problems do you solve with what solutions? You have to tell people the incredible value of your business and your inspection services. You have to overwhelm your clients with incredible value. That's all about marketing. Without marketing or business, forget it. Doesn't mean if you hold a license, great, good. You've met the absolute legal minimum requirement to perform an inspection. Doesn't mean you're making you're going to make a great living. So internetchi, that's our role. We help home inspectors go from good to great. We help home inspectors be incredibly successful. We help home inspectors by providing all the resources that you need. We try to put everything online and everything included with your membership fee. Some things that's not possible, like, you know, hiring a professional website designer, you know, natchi.org slash website, um, buying business cards that are printed in your hand, um, a home maintenance book that's in your hand, uh, buying a, an infrared camera or, or a moisture meter that we talked about recently, or a high lumens flashlight. 
those things cost, you know, it's. So this is my inspection report. And if you were reading my report and you were my friendly competitor, we could talk about this picture here, my feet on the roof, my hand on the shingles, my hand on the vent pipe. This is a great inspection report. I love my inspection reports. Lots of pictures, very concise. And the things that are wrong, they're red, all caps, bolded, and italicized. I don't, everything else is black and blue. Anything that's wrong is red. I want to make sure that no judge is going to say, well, why did you choose blue for things that are major defects? Well, no, not me. Major defects are clearly highlighted in red. And you can frankly, frankly, you can skip over all, all the stuff that's in black and blue. And just look for the red stuff, right? So lots of, uh, I, you know, when I inspect, I think of the system and then I move in closer and I look at the components. And when you read my inspection report, it's by system. And then I break it down into components, right? So if I go backwards here, here's plumbing, water supply, water heater. Now this is a system, right? And I break down the water heater into components, the size, the age, water shutoff valve, connections, gas shutoff valve relief valve, discharge pipe, water leak catch pan. So it's the system of the hot water source and then I break it down into components. That's how I inspect it too. And actually the layout of my inspection report is the same way as my inspection process. So after hot water, I inspect the electrical. And after hot water in my inspection report, the electrical comes up in my inspection report. It's kind of like the same way as the standards of practice as well. So there's a flow. It's called continuity of experience. Like when you do an inspection with me, I'll inspect the roof first. And then you'll remember, oh, he inspected the roof. First. And then my inspection report, the first thing that pops up is his roof, right? And then the home maintenance book that I give you, the first thing that pops up is his roof. So everything has a flow to it. It isn't all discombobulated and disconnected. It's a really good experience. You want your clients to have a great experience. I like all these pictures in, in this inspection page, page 30. There's the garage, got some problems in there. There's a laundry, there's the attic space and the framing. There's the bathrooms, I grouped the bathrooms together. There's the kitchen, I grouped the kitchen together. There's the interior and there's the property. My client was with, wasn't with me. That's why I did the videos of the roof. And I actually tell my client, we prefer to have our clients with us during the entire inspection for these reasons. Um, because if it turns out to be a problem, it may be too late, basically. And there's the standards of practice abbreviated. And there's some illustrations you can get from Internet Cheese Inspection Gallery to, to improve and boost your inspection report to make it look nice. There's the, remember the jetted tub in the, uh, some window problems. I took an infrared camera, shot that. And there's some illustrations of a air conditioning system and the dripping hot water tank, you know, TPR valve, the illustration there. There's a conclusion. You know, I like uh, how we tell them we can't see behind walls, right? So you should not think of my inspection report as a guarantee. Um, and we uh, wear indoor shoes only. So if, you, if the seller has a problem with a stain on their carburetor, it wasn't us. And we leave that letter to the seller on the kitchen counter. We also email it if we have that information available. Sometimes that's not shared and sometimes we don't want to we don't reach out to someone who doesn't want to talk to us necessarily. Um, and then we get paid. So the summary um, I can do immediately after my inspection because I use a mobile report software and I can click and get the summary. And then a couple more clicks and a quick scan through and a double check to make sure I have everything inspected and uploaded the way I want it. Um, and I can do the full report and it's electronic. I simply send my client uh, a link and they go to the cloud and they look at the report. All right, um, let's end it. It's been 
almost three hours. That's a lot of fun. That's great. Has it been three hours? Yeah. Yep. One, two, three. Yep. So um, I want to thank you. Uh, please take a look at these URLs. Natcha.org slash contact, contact is where we all are um, at Internachi. You can contact any one of us if you need any help with anything. Uh, Natcha.org slash webinar is where you can register for the next webinar and where all the video recordings of all the webinars are located. There's a URL there. Don't wait for me to send you a link. Just go there and natchi.org slash podcast. Um, download a podcast and listen to us. Uh, we have a, a couple hundred podcast episodes and uh, you can learn more uh, while you're driving around. So I want to thank you for that. And thank you for the webinar. Thank you for attending your attentiveness, your chats, your questions. It's been really fun. A lot of fun. Like hanging out with you all. Uh, again, my name is Ben Gromico. I'm from Internachi. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. Bye.